Welcome to DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us for another edition of DAX Machina. Uh, joining me tonight in, in the studio is my brothers from Other Mothers, Steve Wildman Monroe's and Robbie Rip Reigns. Steve from here in Springfield, Missouri, and Robbie from South Crackalacky in a little town called Pickens, where uh, number 45 just recently visited. He got a badass challenge coin. Uh, joining us in the studio is an old friend of mine from back in the day where we, uh, we grew up together. His name is Chris. Uh, if he wants to reveal his last name, I'll, I'll let him, but I'm not going to say it without his permission. Uh, but we're going to be talking about some of the crazier stories that have happened from around the Ozarks and some of the crazy stuff him and I got into when we were younger men. And, uh, and it's, I think it's going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, before we get started, though, I uh, want to, to, to say uh, y'all uh, keep a, a few of our, our viewers in, in your uh, thoughts and prayers. Werewolf 5674, he's one of our moderators. Uh, he, some friends of his were injured in a, in a pretty bad accident, uh, so keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, Doc won't be with us tonight. His, uh, his wife was able to come home. She's been down nursing her, her father, uh, but she actually got to come home, so Doc's spending time with his bride. And a quick shout-out, because this will be the last show before the actual date, uh, but happy 30th anniversary to my, uh, my, my little bride, Annette. Uh, hopefully uh, she's watching this. She probably ain't. Uh, realistically, she's probably watching something like with true crime in it. But uh, happy anniversary, babe! It's been crazy thirty years. Let's see where the next thirty takes us, folks. How you guys doing tonight? Well, you know, I'm a little concerned that uh, you you referred to what she likes to watch as true crime because I think the three of us getting together uh, in any one place is a crime against humanity. But you know, she'd be right up her alley. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with Steve on that one. We were watching a, a documentary on John Wayne Gacy, and that uh, that's a weird dude. Yeah, was it Chuckles? Was that what what is? Now, what was this? Some kind of clown. I don't remember what the name yeah, was. I don't remember what it was. John Bobo? Bobo or something? Yeah, Bobo or something like that. Been. It wasn't Bobo. Wait a minute. Either Bobo or JoJo or something like that. It was a short name like that. The, Bogo. that net Bogo the clown. The Netflix show or movie or document, whatever, what docudrama. Yeah, whatever. That's what we're watching. The three part Netflix. Yeah, that that was <laughs> strange. That is a uh, he's creepy. I don't think Pennywise would have gone around him. Yeah, even Pennywise would have been like, "Nope, I'm out." Nope, sorry. <laughs> that's a little too <laughs> weird. We for all me. float down here. <laughs> well, Chris, thanks for joining us, man. How you doing, dude? Not bad, not bad. I got my meds back to where they need to be, so the walls quit talking. <laughs> well, your audio's thing. good. Your audio's good and strong, but uh, unfortunately, you're, we couldn't figure out the the issue with your camera. So, folks, just kind of bear mm -hmm. with us. Uh, Chris is going to be able to uh, going to chime in and answer our questions. It's just we couldn't get his camera f situation figured out. Yeah, thanks Papa for uh, had us there. hanging out with us, man. Yeah, Papa has his Pogo the clown. Yep, Pogo the clown. Uh, well, boys, uh, you guys excited for the uh, upcoming uh, Gatlinburg Bigfoot Convention? I know Robbie is. Yep, yep, we're gonna have a good time. I think it's gonna be right. gonna be a hoot and a half. I'm excited to hear the stories. Yeah, we gotta we'll get there'll be quite a few. We gotta get Steve uh, conventions. I say I'll, yeah, I'll be in the do. Caribbean when uh, when y'all are doing that. I believe. Uh, I, the last week or two of the month uh, i'll uh, i'll be out of the country where are you going uh we are taking a cruise a, yeah taking a cruise out of new orleans um uh what grand cayman jamaica cozumel uh, just a lot of uh um you know tropical refreshment i might have to uh uh, send some money with you for the duty free store. <laughs> I said the last time I, 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 my lovely bride gave me permission to spend more than I thought I'd be allowed to. But, uh, That's always a good thing. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
So we're we're going to be talking about some of the crazier stuff from around here in the Ozark, uh, and and there have been some pretty weird stuff. Uh, one of the first things that uh, I want to mention is if you guys have read my short story or listened to Cam's narration, I think it was Miss Naoma that did the narration uh, called the called the cabin and uh, no, the house in the woods. That was based on something that really happened to me and Chris. Now, granted. What the heck? What was I that? Got my work in. <laughs> uh, Pogo found us. Yeah. Pogo. Yeah, but, um, that's what happened. I thought we got caught in a time loop there for a second. Yeah, I was like, what the <laughs> hell just happened? Yeah. But, uh, you know, Chris and I actually did find that house out in the woods. It was it was just just as I described it in the story. Uh, I did dramatize, you know, the, the 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 run through the woods, but something did follow us. And it, you know, we were talking about what was hit the side of the house and everything. And for like two or three weeks after that, there was all kinds of weird shit going on around around their farm. Uh, but I think one of the weirdest things that uh, that always struck me about the land that, that Chris's family used to own was a place that uh, you guys used to call the Devil's Altar. Devil's Rock. Devil's Rock, that's right. You want to tell us a little bit more about that? <clears throat> Just a big pile of rocks out in the woods that had no business being there. <laughs> yeah, it kind of had like an altar stone on top of it. Yeah, it did, but yeah, the I know that. Didn't go anywhere near it. Nothing. The cows wouldn't go up there, horses, the dogs didn't like going there. We had to make them go with us. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, uh, Looks like there are two or three cars that have been completely disassembled up there from like the 20s and 30s. <laughs> well, they, there was field all around it. And it was just like this really weird stand of trees in the middle of the field with this, this rock altar in the middle of it and just a just an area of weirdness around it. The horses wouldn't go in those trees. The cows wouldn't go in those trees. And uh, like he was saying, the dogs didn't even want to follow us in there. But uh, they would, but they were like acting weird the whole time we were in there. I mean, they were German shepherds. They weren't, you know, small dogs. <laughs> yeah, they weren't. They weren't the do dogs that are typically afraid of me. Uh, but when we found that house in the woods, that that was what really kind of kind of surprised me. Is it was surrounded by woods on all sides. There was just like this old, overgrown road going up to it, like a like an old driveway. But there was no gate anywhere near it. Uh, it just like it was just in the middle of the woods and been overgrown. First thing we found was this old plow uh, sitting out there just rusting. And then we started finding old cars from like the, I would have said those cars were probably from the 40s and early 50s, maybe, maybe even older, yeah. maybe in the late 30s, early 40s. Uh, there was a truck and a car that were just completely rust, rusted out. And that's when, then we saw the house. Uh, it had one of those exterior root cellars that was right out the front of the house in about, about 20 yards away. Uh, but we didn't have the balls to go down in that fruit cellar. <laughs> we didn't go down to that. Like, no, I don't think I no, want to go down. No. <laughs> yeah, not today. <laughs> I don't think I brought enough ammo to go down in that fruit cellar. <laughs> but the See? weird part about that house was like the front porch was like crumbling, and everything. There was still furniture inside, while most of it rotted away. Uh, there was a one of those big pot belly cast iron uh, eating stoves in the living room. And there was one of those uh, uh, cast iron cooking uh, wood fired stoves in the kitchen, and it was they were both in still real good shape because they'd been in and out of the, out of the elements. Um, they looked like you could have just cleaned them up a little bit, started started using them again. And those were both expensive items to leave behind. That is not something that people would leave behind lightly. Of course, neither were the cars, uh, but the place looked look like it was abandoned in a hurry because there was still broken furniture inside. Um, there, the staircase was only like just about as wide as my shoulders. It wasn't like a, like a big staircase. And uh, the whole place looked like it was about to fall in. And uh, Chris was like, let's go upstairs. I'm like, let's not. I don't want those stairs to fall. <laughs> and he goes, I think they're pretty solid. So he climbed up on them and kind of shook them a little bit. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit, stairs are solid. So we went upstairs. <laughs> the yeah. first room upstairs was just had like, uh, the windows were busted out and there was like leaf littering crap on the, on, on the uh, floor. When you turned and went into the first bedroom right off that landing, that's where we saw this freaking huge nest. It was probably eight to ten feet across, had branches woven together. And uh, it, it, downstairs, there was like feces on the ground. 
upstairs, not a drop. Yeah. yeah there was no poop upstairs. Um, which, you know, we, we, you know, the stairs were too narrow for cows to have gotten up there. But this nest was like woven together tightly. Uh, and there were little bones in it, like some squirrels and rabbits and stuff. Like that. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. interesting. Wasn't the word we used? Yeah, like <laughs> oh shit. Well, that was the word we used. That, that was about the time we heard something boom into the back of the house, hard enough that shook the house. And um, yeah. you did you had the shotgun and I had the twenty two, right? No, nah, you always had your shotgun. Well, well, well uh, the shotgun got. I stuck the barrel out the window and just fired off around into the air. Just boom. And of course, at that point, we heard something beating feet out through the woods, and that was that was the time we decided we needed to be somewhere else. Yeah, the dog already decided that. <laughs> yeah, the dog was long gone. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah, pretty much. She was smarter than we were. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She <laughs> got there. Discretion was the better part of valor for that dog long before anything started kicking off. Um, yeah, but yeah. we uh, we took off running out the front of the house and ran back past the cars and stopped at that uh at that pl that plow, and that's when we were here. We could hear stuff getting thrown at us. It wasn't like hitting close to us, but there was stuff getting thrown at us. Uh, so we hauled ass back down the road to uh, roughly where we thought we'd come onto that little road, and then turned and headed up through the woods. And we could hear stuff pacing us in the trees on both sides. Uh, made it to the barbed wire fence, jumped over the barbed wire fence, and we could hear something was pissed off, like shaking trees inside the tree line. And that's when the guy that lived the next farm down just happened to pull up in his truck. Like, you boys want to ride? And we're like, boom, into the back of that truck. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was never more happy to see a pickup truck pull up than I was. because It was still a good half mile run down that gravel road to, to Chris's place. Uh, you yeah. know, we would have been, we'd have been nervous sons of bitches making there. And then for, you know, it was a couple of weeks after that, uh, the people that had the next farm up, one of their cattle got killed. Uh, they would hear stuff like on their back porch rattling the doorknobs trying to get in the house at night. Uh, yeah, there was some weird shit going on out there in the woods next to his old place. Yeah. yeah. You hadn't gotten out there. You might have had your bones in that nest. Well, that well, was that night down the, the low water bridge, too. When there Which was water, was water runner, that, that little, uh, concrete slab bridge down the road yeah. from when we were slowing down because the water was over there and something hit the side of the truck with a rock. Yeah, and then I remember there was one time it was you and me, and I can't remember who else was with us, and you were in the back of the truck, and next thing I know, the back of the truck swerves off to the left, and you were in the in the cab with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that wasn't a I was, rock. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was much thinner. I was able to go through that little partition window. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah, it was now it was like, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think he was there. I can't remember who else, but you know, Bob filled up the whole seat by himself. So, <laughs> hey, Travis Drum, congratulations! Fourteen months membership of the DAX Machination. Thanks, man. Much appreciated. There's a lot of weird stuff out in that that area of Laclede County. Uh, just a few miles down the road from there is a place called Hull's Ford. And uh, that story I told you guys that, uh, that a buddy of mine uh, had said that his dad was fly fishing. Uh, well, he was fishing from a, uh, a kayak and saw one sitting at the edge of the road, just uh, edge of the water, just watching him. That was right there, just up, up on the Gasconade up, up from Hull's Ford. Yeah, and that's where we used to go hang out. <laughs> yeah, we used to spend a lot of time up at Old Ford. Well, we camped down by that, that concrete bridge. Yep. We get borrowed the canoe that one time and floated down to the bridges. Yeah, well, that was in the dead of winter, too. I don't know what we were thinking. It, it was hot. And, yeah, we were hot, and we were both just out of the arm. Yeah, we were both. It was hot, and we were just both out of the Army and said, eh, what the hell? <laughs> that water was cold. If we were freezing yeah. our asses off by the time we made it to Twin Bridges, though. Yeah. It's amazing we didn't see anything there. Well, it was, it, the, 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 the air temperature was hot, but that water was so freaking cold. 
Yeah. We thought, you know, it's it's a, it's a warm day in the wintertime. We're going to go put that canoe in. And <laughs> when the sun started going down, the colder we got. <laughs> so, hey, Sentinel's in the house. What's up, yep. buddy? So, there was a, we used to call it the death road next to my grandmother's house. It was just a, one of them old dirt roads where people used to dump garbage on. I mean, all of us about the same age. You remember the remember roads like that? You find little old washing machines and everything yeah. else laying out there? Well, uh, me and my dad and my grandfather, before he died, were out and uh, I had had one of those projects at school. You know, you pick up aluminum cans and, you know, the people who brought the most aluminum cans in got, you know, pizza part, whatever it was. I can't remember. So my dad was like, well, hey, we'll go out there on, uh, I can't even, I think it's Piney Grove Road or something like that was the name of the road. We'll go out there and, uh, you know, people just throw all kinds of cans out there. And we didn't go into this place, but we was out there in the, the big area where people just kind of pulled off the side of the road and started throwing stuff out. There was an old abandoned house out behind that area. We never went and looked at it, but it was I mean, it was like this, like I said, it was a dirt road and this was like probably a hundred yards off the road and it was nothing but woods that surrounded it. So <laughs> Steve peeing on trees. <laughs> I wonder if that's kind of a a natural thing that that they would look for in situations like that is as, as a natural structure that they don't have to do do a whole lot of work because I had been I've been on that road at night when I started driving as a teenager, and it is, or it was spooky as hell. But it's just one of those roads that you would see in a in a horror movie. No nobody lived on it. It was just a long dirt road that went from one uh, main road to the other. It was just one of those places like you thought there's just you don't want to get caught on this road at night. It's like it was a, a scene out of your book. She would write for. Uh, Kitten says uh, Pine Grove and Oconee or Pickens. Uh, Pickens runs right off uh, one one thirty. Goes from Pickens to Dakisville. It runs in between uh, right next to Reed's Auto or right down below Reed's Auto. If you know what I'm talking about, Ken. I've I've often speculated that you know houses that are left abandoned out in very rural areas that these things will probably use. I mean, they're opportun opportunistic. And if they're, you know, if they're any type of intelligence at all, well, hell, even, even you know, bears and rabbits and everything else under the sun will try to get in someplace out of the weather, whether they've had to dig a burrow of their own or they're using natural caves or things like that. So these things, are, these things are smart enough to get out of the weather. Uh, so if you've got an old abandoned house out in the woods that nobody lived in and probably hasn't in decades, I would say it's very likely you're going to find signs of habitation for something like this. Well, if nothing else, it could be used for some kind of, you know, building materials. You know? Right. Well, we found yeah. that nest on the upper floor of that one. And uh, yeah. at the time, I remember thinking, what the hell builds a nest like that? Uh, and that was long before I'd ever read anything about Dr. Goodall's research. I didn't know gorillas built nests like that. No idea. And Chris and I were both were like, what the is that? Richie's got a question about it, DA. Uh, what was the crazy thing throwing rocks or the house? Uh, we were in Laclede County, Missouri, out off of uh, 32 Highway, off of, off of East 32. Well, that, that whole area from basically... Hull Ford to Hidden Valley Lake is just some very thickly wooded weird shit out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Eric, <laughs> Eric, Eric used to live off of uh, uh, off of H Hidden Valley Lake Road, and they had weird crap at their, their house out there all the time. <laughs> Thanks for the super yeah. chat, yeah, Sentinel. Appreciate it, man. Straight pair character waving flags and turning around making. <laughs> Well, I've actually met two people that rented my parents' old place, and they're still really? have problems with their stuff out there. Yeah, one was telling us, telling me and my wife that you know it's haunted, and I'm like, 
okay, well, I built the house, so what do you guys do to it? You know. Well, the, 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 there was the house that was behind it, the one y'all lived in yeah, when you were like, building, building the cabin. Yep. Uh, that yep. old house gave, gave me the heebie-jeebies every time I went in. Yeah, it's gone now. I figured it was probably torn down not too long after that, but yeah, that, that place was was pretty rough. Is the uh, is the 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 uh, altar still out there? I don't know. I just went when we bought the place here. We went up because that my parents' place is up for sale at the same time, and we went up and just you know introduced ourselves. It's like I you know I built this house. They're like no way. I'm like yeah, I kind of did. You know. <laughs> So I said, you know, I'd bring pictures over sometime of what the place looked like before. And I showed them where, you know, here's where the walnut trees were that are gone now. Here's where this was and, you know, this and that. And, but I didn't get it. We, you know, I didn't get up past the driveway. <laughs> well, I wonder if that house, that house we found in the woods is still out there. A, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I ever found out who owned that land. The land was foreclosed by the bank in like 77 78 during that crunch and it was still bank owned when i went in the army in 87 i think some guy at fort leonard wood bought it in like 89 or 91 somewhere in that time frame i wonder if uh we could track it down track it down to see if we could get back on there uh yeah we could because um um there's a woman I went to high school with works at the assessor's office. And when I was in there last, she was helping somebody else find out who owned a parcel of land. <laughs> the, um, the, so. it, it was, that place was in pretty rough shape 30 years ago. So well, heck, it was longer than that, like 35 years ago. Um, well, I was, I was, it, I was all 15 at the time. <laughs> so we, I, I bet that house has probably collapsed in by, on itself by now. Well, if you remember, when you walked across that field and you got to the creek, there was a house straight ahead that was caved in. Mm -hmm. And then when you went to the left, which would have been south, I think, is where that ho the house with all the cars and the nest was. But if you remember, if you went north, there was that other house with that big barn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the barn was all stocked full of hay. I don't know what they, it was using, you know, being used for, but, you know, the house... It looks like somebody, like 1977, said, eh, I'm done, walked out, left everything. Literally left everything. Well, there were no power poles to that house. There wasn't a nope. single power pole run up to that house. No. Nope. So, and that, if I remember correctly, that area of the county uh, got got a rural electric power in the 50s. So I, I don't that know. House would have been, that house that had been bit, pr built prior to the 50s for it not yeah. have power poles. Right. And some and the boards on the porch had square nails in them, so I bet that house had probably been there, probably eighty to a hundred years when we found it. No, oh, probably, no doubt. Because the one that with the nest in it had that um, that one shed with the pump in it. Mm -hmm. I was saying there's something else in there too, but it, you know, mechanical. But I'm not so. <laughs> well, we were also, you know. We were also teenagers at the time. Yeah, we were, we were more interested in the cars. <laughs> yeah, we were more interested in the cars and looking for anything cool that we could find. Yeah. I was kind of hoping to find an old gun. Even if it was all rusted out, it would have been cool to hang like above the fireplace or something, but there wasn't anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> Dead Man says, DA is a lonely freight hauler. I need more audio books sure. about the wild hunt. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, Cam, I was talking to Cam just a week or so ago, and his uh, he's got he's he doesn't do the Dixie Cryptid and, and audiobooks full time. He's got a full time job, and he was apologizing to me even then. He said, "Dude, I have just been slammed with work for months." He said, "It looks like it's probably going to slow down before the end of summer." Uh, he said, and "Hopefully, I can start getting more stuff out then." He said, but he's, I, he's, he's working 12, 14 hours a day, just trying to keep his head above water on the, all the projects they've got going.
Sorry, I was trying to catch up with some of the comments. Chad it's, is flying. Yeah, I, I saw something. I was trying to get up there. and I, It's like if you look away for a second, it's like buried. Denise Cio says, I've listened for a long time, just never had the guts to say much, so appreciate it. Denise, chime in anytime. You are always welcome. You know, we uh we might be we might put the fun and dysfunctional, but we're all family here. So feel free to chime in anytime you want. We definitely do that. We definitely do. I'm trying to scroll back to see if I missed any questions. David Bice says if it's still there, it's probably collapsed. That would be my guess too. It, you know, it, I would say it's probably falling in on itself because the porch was or was falling in then. Um, the uh, the interior of the house was in remarkably good shape for the time, but there wasn't a piece of glass left in that house. So, you know, thirty, you know, it, it was not in great shape then. So, add another thirty, almost forty years. I, I, I was fifteen at the time. I'm fifty three now. That's yeah. what it's at. 38 years. Yeah, it was 85, 86 time frame. Because 86, yeah. I got my license and we just started, you know, it was everything in the car after that. <laughs> well, we, uh, back then gas was cheap. We would load up, load up the car, load up the truck. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and back then, most of Laclede County was gravel roads. And we would just start driving gravel roads looking for weird shit. And we found a lot of it. Hold on. I just heard a big boom out in front of the house. I'll be right back. All right. Take your gun. Oh, of course. Uh-oh. My wife's on, so I got to be nice now. <laughs> uh, David Bice says the pot belly and cook stoves would still be worth a lot if they're still there. I can't imagine anybody would have taken them out of there. I mean, especially if they were nah. falling in. But those, those cast mm -hmm. iron, they were in great shape back then. They weren't even really that rusty. Nah, I'll see if I can find out who owns it, and then you know we'll take. You know, you can come up here. We'll jump in a jeep and go out there. I'm not walking it now. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little old and long, long in the tooth to uh, take a hike yeah. to, a mile through the woods like we did once before. Yeah. Well, given what you saw, you would be probably wanting to bring in a little bit more uh, tactical equipment than you started with the last time. Oh. Oh, we would definitely go far better armed than a twenty-two and a and a twelve gauge. Yeah, twenty-two pistol and a twelve gauge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a I've got a much better twelve gauge now. I've got a KSG, so I think it would have 15, 15 slugs in it as opposed to the three the other one held. Yeah, yeah and you wasted one shooting out the window. Yeah, well, no, I have plenty. I had plenty in my pockets. I oh. immediately loaded another one up. But uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't exactly what we were carrying tactical gear. We were we were loaded. We, we had a shotgun loaded, set up for hunting. Yeah, we were loaded for squirrel. Basically, yeah. <laughs> carrying a, a backpack with a couple of bologna sandwiches in it, and extra ammo, <laughs> and a canteen. <laughs> that was back before either of us were smart enough to take a first aid kit. <laughs> yeah, we'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah. It's before you knew Doc to make sure he had the right kind of kit with you. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, back then we were both. Uh, says, Get, need any help, DA? Let me know. We'll do. But uh, yeah. hopefully, Chris, if you can find out who owns that land, I would love to get yeah. that on there. I would too. And if you can get if you can get permission from the uh, from the people that are that have your guys' old house. I'd like to walk yeah. back there or take a vehicle back there to that the old old altar because I've got a really but good the camera. The thing is, they they broke up that property because the only property, um, so I'll have to look for that too because the house down to the the pond at the bottom of the hill, that eight acres there was sectioned off, and they put two mobile homes on that. Oh, that's a shame. So, you don't. Yeah. There was already. There was already too many people living down that road. What was there, like four? Four, yeah. <laughs> there was, a, there was a one farm on that one farm on the other side of the low water low water bridge, and then there yeah, was the house. Samson. There was the house right there in the corner with the big barn across the field from yours, and then there was the yeah. farm just down from yours. Yeah, because um, the first one Leroy Sampson owned, and his son actually still works it. 
Nice. When we drove out there, I talked to him for a bit. I don't know what happened to the Davis farm. I, I know Carl Davis was wanting it when his dad passed, but, you know, I've been out of this area 30-something years almost now until just last year. And then the Howards, he died, and they sold the place to a welder. And he actually bought my parents' place when they went to New Mexico. But from what I understand, he just finally gave everything up, sold everything, moved to town. So maybe I just I need to go out there one evening I and just knock on your door. <laughs> I would love to be able to get back there and get some pictures of the Devil's Altar and see if we can find that house again. Well, I know we yeah. can find it. We know exactly the area where it's at. Getting to it might be the, the tricky part. But. Yeah. We could find a gate uh, through the fence over where the Howards were at. I think we could get a truck over there or your Jeep. Well, right across from my parents' place, there was a gate. We just didn't have a, you know, well, that, the bank. The on it had more rust on it than, than yeah. some cars. The bank on it. We'd have bolt, had to bolt cutter that off. There wasn't a way that get, that thing was open. Yeah. Yeah. Robbie, what was in your front yard? I, it, might have, it must have just been somebody shooting fireworks for some reason because it just sounded like it. So it's probably somebody down the road a little ways. The dogs went nuts, so that's the only reason I... But... I didn't see anything, had, so I'm, I'm assuming that's what it was. We had uh, neighbors to the north of us that moved in. We don't care for them. They've been nothing but a pain in the ass since uh, since they moved in. But uh, they were dropping fireworks at like 1, 2 in the morning the other morning. Yeah. Another reason I want to move out in the country, I'm sick of neighbors. I have no neighbors. Must be nice. It is. It is very nice. But we live in Tennessee. Neighbors were on top of us. They'd still be shooting off fireworks on like 7th, 8th of July. And it got to be a pain in the ass that the Christmas decorations on fire. It's terrible. Dark. Oh. Oh. So, uh, you were uh, you were going to tell us a little bit about uh, about some of the other things you've seen, Chris. Uh, specifically, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is, uh, and I know I know you still have to have to have a certain amount of clearance for the job you have. Uh, yeah. So I, have, I don't want I don't want to press you on any details on something like that. But you used to be an auditor, right? Uh, auditor. That's correct. Nuclear facilities. Yep. Nuclear weapons. And because and, of that, uh, you've seen some pretty bizarre shit. Yeah, and I've been read into some pretty bizarre stuff. Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I know what you want to talk about, and that was the, the air guard thing. Absolutely. You want to tell us that story? Uh, yeah. One of Crystal's friends is married to a full-time Air National Guardsman out at the – I don't even remember what – it's a refueling unit. They have KC-135s. The – when – the air ba guard base was an Air Force base. It had B-52s as well. So the runway is really, really long for big, heavy aircraft. But the only thing that ever flies in there are the KC-135s. Any other aircraft, they'll park over on the civilian side of the airport. And I've seen you know, F-18s, A-6 intruders, you know, everything except K KC-135s over there. Anyway, she gets a, a panic call from her friend saying that they got the base locked down because something's going on. And, you know, of course, wild speculation of we're going to war with, insert, you know, country here. And uh, there was a convoy uh, coming down to Alcoa, Tennessee, where the Knoxville International Airport is. Um, for some reason, and well, being a friend of DAs for as long as I've been, uh, I had a red badge that I can go anywhere on the airport I wanted to, so I did on the civilian side. So I went over there, 
and watched, and they actually had, I think it was a C5 Galaxy, or maybe the C17 Global Winch, one of the great big cargo planes, and they loaded a couple great big boxes onto it, and then they took off, and then everybody was released. Um, if you don't know about the Oak Ridge, Tennessee area, that's where Oak Ridge National Lab is, and also the Y-12 National Security Complex. And they do a lot of secret stuff up there. And to the point where, as an auditor, I would go to Y-12 in a government car. I would pull up, show my government ID with my top secret clearance. And then I would still get you know, randomly searched and, you know, with the dogs and everything. Um, security there... Um, probably makes most embassy security look lax. They were probably more heavily armed than, you know, the embassy in, in uh, Baghdad or someplace. These guys were, were loaded up, ready to go all the time. <laughs> so they think it, this, the rumors say that something came off the Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, I've seen weird stuff there. I can't really get into it because I have that NDA and uh, I don't want to disappear. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but then they came back saying there's some kind of something that they, the government built is what was taken on that airplane. And by built, they meant in a bio lab. But they locked the airport down, locked the air guard base down. And, uh, yeah, I was at the time, uh, with the Tennessee guard, I was, a a military police company commander and we weren't allowed on the base or anything. So there's no telling, just speculation, but, uh, the plane took off and we never saw it again. I want, I, I really wonder what was in that. You know, I, what, I don't what, know. What was in those boxes? Uh, Corey I, Coles I don't know. Was Go ahead. I would say they're, they're big. I mean, they're not, you know, boxes like, you know, rings of paper size. They're like put an elephant in kind of size. And, you, you know. If you wonder what what kind of experiment requires a box that big to move it. Yeah, or multiple boxes that big. Right. Corey Cole says, a friend of mine said he walked by an old arboretum at an abandoned homestead. And the second time he walked by it, there was a large steaming set of lungs laying on the bench. That is a warning. Something put yeah. that there telling you, you, know, you keep sticking around, it's going to probably be your lungs laying on this bench. <laughs> I think I would yeah. say that was definitely a warning. You know, this is what we're capable of. Maybe you want to mosey on. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I don't know. I, and I crawled, you know, I, I went all over. The Oak Ridge National Lab when I worked there, and I was telling you earlier, you know, I've seen the the Kraken computer, uh, which at one time was the fastest supercomputer in the world, and then I think they renamed it the Titan because the Kraken got surpassed by something in China, and then we surpassed it back. And every time they do that, they rename the stupid thing. <laughs> well, when when we were in high school, the big one was the one the CIA had. The Cray supercomputer. The Cray, that's yeah. yeah. Congrats, but now, your watch, yeah. now your watch has more computing power than the computers we had. So. Yeah. Well, the, uh, <laughs> I remember when we were in high school, when they made the movie The Last Starfighter, they had yeah. to book time on a Cray supercomputer to do the mm. CGI for that. So it was, yeah. while it was cutting edge for its day, most people can do better CGI on a desktop now. Yeah, and then you go back further to Tron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they booked time on an XMP for that as yeah. well. Yeah. Robbie, that uh, that's actually a good theory. We should put to the test. Uh, we'll when in time we go out to to film, if we can find abandoned buildings, we should check them. Yeah, I agree. Because that's not the first time I've heard stuff like that. Um. I've heard a lot of people from a lot of different areas with similar stories. I mean, you know, whether it be two story, you know, one story, whatever. Um, that's why I was asking, do you think that's like a, something that they look at is maybe a, 
I guess not a natural habitat, but just, hey, I don't have to do a lot of work in here. Yeah, like an opportunity opportunity to use it. They're very opportunistic. It'd be like, uh, like you know, if it starts thunderstorming while even like Sam Mountain Lion is in the woods, if there's an overhanging of rock, it's going to get under it. it. You know, didn't build it, but it'll use it. Uh, I think it'd be the same thing with, with, you know, with human-made structures that are still largely intact. Uh, I think uh, anything, even bears, would probably use one in a pinch. Uh, especially yeah. if these things are, are if these things, well, I don't really believe that Bigfoot are migratory per se. I think that these creatures uh, have to follow the, follow the food supply because as big as these things are, if they stuck to a two or 300 acre area, there'd be no food in it in a month. Oh, I, we, I think we, we both agreed on that. We talked about that last time. You know, if a mountain lion's got 250, 260 mile you know, circuit for their home territory. Yeah, the range is massive. I would feel very comfortable saying anywhere from fifteen to two thousand square miles for uh, you know a decent sized clan group pod, whatever you want to call them. And you know, I think a lot of that kind of lends credence to why you might see see them in this area, and then all of a sudden you don't see them for a while. Right. I I think. I mean, if you look at the sighting reports, you know, you in certain areas, the sightings all cluster about the same time of the year. Yep. Uh, like like uh, some of the reports I've taken uh, in the Mark Twain uh, up near Farmington, the area, the, the sighting clusters up there all seem to be like midsummer, early fall. Uh, but then you get down around Branson uh, and the, cl- the cluster seems to be like September, October. Yeah. And I, it, I, we talked about that with, you know, with the Beast of Bray Road too, because that that's the same thing. Is you'll see sightings pop up and pop off for like a month or two, and then you won't see it again for a couple months, and then sightings will come back up. So I, I think it's the same thing. I think they're following a food source, whatever you know, elk, deer, moose, whatever mm-hmm. they happen to be feeding on. I think they're following that, that food source, and you know, with Sasquatch, they could probably be following more than just right you know, looking at looking at the cave systems who, who knows where you know where they're going in and, and coming out well when uh when we filmed uh when steve and i filmed in uh, in joe bald i believe that was in october mm-hmm. yeah yeah it was it was well into fall you know I, i'm sure somebody has done it i don't know if we have done it or not i'd be curious to uh overlay some of that with migratory patterns of elk and deer that would be an interesting kind of little theory to kind of jump onto. Yeah. Well, it would make sense that something that big would, would have to have a lot of, you know, a lot of food source to be able to function. A lot of territory because you could like, like DA said, you can't have something that size in that small area. It's got, it's got to have a massive range. Right. They live off of moss and berries. Yeah, the, the Mark Twain National Forest is about 2.5 million acres, and that is plenty enough territory to, su- so, to support a couple of large, go- uh, large, uh, large family groups or several smaller family groups. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and nobody really knows how large a group is. I mean, you know, it could exactly. be, it could be five or six. It could be, you know, ten or fifteen. Who knows? Because, um, who was it that told the story about that? Uh, that old prospector that got uh, kidnapped and, and oh the um, oh uh, you always want to talk about the one he, he, he gave him coffee he, and all that stuff. He finally yeah, got the Albert, Hoffman, Albert Hoffman story up in uh, yeah. uh, British Columbia. Yeah, I think he said what uh, six. I think is what he said the number was. I mean, I, no, I think it was four. I think it was an adult four. male and adult female. And what he described as an adolescent male and female. Okay, I was thinking he said six for some reason. Maybe maybe six was the number at the uh, Ape Canyon thing. Uh, I don't think they ever had a full n- a number in, at the Ape Canyon one. Uh, mm-hmm. They just they shot the one that they saw, and then they were attacked by numerous creatures during the course of the night. But still, I mean, that's what they've seen. Though we don't know for sure if that's a. That could have just been true. one one element of a, a larger group. I mean, it, 
Um, let me see what uh, what's an average troop size of, for chimpanzees or gorillas. You know, gorillas would be the one. I think gorillas are a fairly large group. Uh, I think so. I think a, a gorilla group is usually around a dozen. Yeah, because I remember watching. Uh, I remember correct. Oh, what was it? Gr- uh, gorillas in the mist. Gorillas were, live in family family groups, usually five to ten, but sometimes uh, two to more than fifty, led by a dominant adult male. So they can it can right. be up to fifty, but usually <laughs> oh five to ten. Uh, Roxanne Delgado says they could uh, they could live in large. What was it? scrolled up? Roxanne Delgado says they could live in a tribe and we wouldn't know it. You're absolutely correct. Yep. Mm-hmm. And, well, and that's something too. I mean. If and you know, I I don't necessarily buy into the the missing link that they're. I think it's just a, a, a misidentified or unidentified species of uh, North American great ape. But if it was more human, then like she said, it could it could be a tribe, and you know, and that could be. 50 to 60 individuals easy if, if it's in tribe status, but you know, if it's, if they're more animal, then you are probably looking at, I would say a good estimate. If you're going to have a good size troop or a clan, I'd say probably 10, maybe, maybe yeah, two. I, I would, I would think as large as the descriptions get, I don't think it could be a big family group. Because yeah. they would plunder the resources out of an area. They'd basically be like goats going through an area. They'd just strip everything edible out of it as they move if you, through. If you say it, if you say a group of ten, that let's say that's two family groups. Mm-hmm. You have two, probably two dominant or you might just have one dominant male with and each one of those are, are a different family group. He's got a family group with this female and a family group with this female. Basically, two alpha females, which I don't know if that work out or not. But, but still, you could. That would be something that would probably be within reason, I would think. Yeah. Well, the with I mean, if you want to compare them to gorillas. Gorillas, you typically have, you know, the the one silverback, and you know he has a couple of wives, if you will, for lack of a better term, a couple of mates. And then you got their kids. Yeah. It could yep. be possible. Mm-hmm. And we and this is just, you know, basing it on primates. We don't we don't know if that's how their societal organization is based. I Not mean, sure. it could even be more similar to wool. Uh, it, it's hard to say, but we do know they're definitely intelligent. Um, Scott says, I heard a story of a dogman who killed all the deer in an area. Uh, threw them down a drain in a drainage ditch and didn't even eat them. What is that? What what does that? Something that's trying to keep uh, something else out of the area. If it's killing all of the prey animals in an area, they're doing it to drive something else out to make it make it impossible for it to eat. Or they're pissed uh, off at trying to prove a point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Penny Van says uh, maybe they have large clans, but only meet up periodically or. Or the area is only occupied full time with females and kids. The males might just do all the hunting, gathering, and return to the women. It's entirely possible. I mean, it, it, we it, we're we're just wildly speculating, basically, uh, because there's not enough data for us to say one way or the other. There's not enough you know enough gathered, documented evidence to say one way or the other. Or um, you know something else that it could it could be, and the reason that you only see in the the sightings are only a lot. Usually, one, the males could be the ones that move around. Females and and children or adolescents may stay in one spot, like maybe in in a cave or in a nest or whatever you want to call it. And the males are the ones that travel around and hunt and just visit these different clans. Yeah. Well, you just read my mind, Robbie. I was thinking about lions. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they only let the males in when they're in heat, when they're ready to mate. And then other than that, the males are loners. You know, basically get the hell out. You're on your own until I need you. Uh, David Bai says, uh, DA, does eight canyons still exist? Yes, it does. But the topography of the area has changed wildly since the uh, 1982 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Uh, there have been expeditions that have, they believe they've actually found the location of the cabin. 
uh, from Ape Canyon. But again, the topography has changed wildly in the, since that eruption. Uh, however, that, that area still is rich with Sasquatch sightings even to this day now that the forests have grown back. Yeah, they think they found there. They found a bunch of nails and uh, the square top nails that match up that same time frame, and, he, and even some pieces from a from yeah. like traps. Uh, Estelle Hardington says we've had coyotes in the deep snow that will wipe out a deer herd. Yeah, yeah. The, the, a lot of times predators will do stuff like that if they have competition. Uh, leave nothing for the competition to eat. And uh, that will drive competition out of the area. It's just it's weird how how that kind of response is response is created. But the you know these are these are animals that are looking to protect the resources. And if they kill everything and you keep it in an area where they can feed on it, won't let anything else near it. Whatever else is their competition is going to have to go somewhere else. That's, that's some kind of interesting theories that we've never talked about, but I, I think that's a, uh, I mean, we might be on to something there, Steve. I mean, it could be that that's, and if you think about when you don't, most of the sightings, you don't really ever hear about, except for the rare occasions when there's multiple that are sighted, it's usually only one. So maybe the males, like you said, are nomadic and they just wander around. That's what you see the most. Yeah. Well, or I mean, like it, in Jurassic Park, if you see one, it may be it's trying to get your attention. You may if you see one, it may be trying to keep your attention. Well, I mean, me personally, and maybe I'm just a just a coward since I'm not a, a hunter or anything like that. But you know, if I run across one, I'm going to de-ask the area immediately and not see the rest of the family. You know, one's enough uh, to give me the hell. Yeah, Robbie tapping his watch. That's exactly it. Yeah. Oh, look, it's it's get the hell out of clock. Okay, I'm leaving. Uh, Jack Max says, how can cryptids live underground in swampy or wetter climates? Uh, down in the swampy areas of Florida, uh, there are still plenty of caves. Uh, a lot of them you would have, uh, the entrance of the cave is through water, uh, but there's plenty of caves back, back even in swampy and marshy areas. You just have to get into the cave and up above the water level. Uh, here in Missouri, I've been to a couple of caves. Uh, it was that cave out by Nebo where the entrance was in water. Remember, Chris? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was that was a butt puckering one because I wasn't sure how much farther I had to go to get up into the air. Turns out it wasn't very far, but that water's murky as hell. And and uh, then there's that one right there in Waynesville. Uh, they had the divers that died in it back in '90. Uh, the, the cave right there off the Rubidoux River. Um, there's that cave right there just outside of Waynesville that people would dive and go back in. And some divers got lost in it. So there's there's lots of caves, even in very wet environments, uh, that will go back and then air pockets are up inside the cave once you get above the water level again. Uh, so even in wet and harsh environments, there's still plenty of opportunity for caves. Mm -hmm. There was another question I was wanting to get. Uh, Poncho Zorch wanted to know if I'd ever seen a squirrel migration. I have not. I have not seen one. Uh Estelle Hardington says, we supposedly don't have wolves, but people are seeing them. And they will yeah. decimate the deer herd. Uh, once wolves are reintroduced into an area, they they do they wreak bloody hell on lots of populations. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, you know to to dovetail onto Estelle's point, you know, just in the late '90s, you know, we officially didn't have mountain lions, you right. know, here in Missouri, but you know, people saw them, and then all of a sudden now it's like, oh yeah, we have mountain lions. Now, people are catching yeah, up the to the mountain yeah. lions. What was that, Chris? I'm sorry. I said I lost a dog to a mountain lion back in the uh, mid '90s here. Well, <laughs> I uh, I moved to the Springfield area in '94, and I was taking a microbiology class in like '95, early '96, and the TA for my class was doing his graduate research on mountain lions, and I told him how I had seen this, you know, female mountain lion and a couple of uh, you know juveniles walking along the road around Missouri Highway 8. And uh, he's like, well, you know, officially we don't have any mountain lions. I said, well, you know, you can kiss my ass. I know what I saw. And uh, he pulled me aside after class, and he's like, you know, just so you know, I'm doing my graduate research. I'm trying to, you know, basically uh, uh, legitimize mountain lions in Missouri. 
and now you know the conservation department says, "Oh yeah, we got them." Oh yeah. You know. In fact, there's even been trail cams caught uh, melanistic or black black mountain lions. Uh, yep. Noah says the Rougarou River, not the Rougarou, the Ruby Dew. Hey, we got a super <laughs> chat from Scott. Thank you much, sir. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, the roaring Ruby Dew <laughs> for the for the uh, by Steve a fund. You know, I. I I did my best. I got a haircut. It still isn't good enough. I don't know what to do with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rock Mendel daughter says, the, the A what cave is that outside of Ozark City? There are actually very uh, quite a few caves right there close to, to Ozark. Uh, I, you, you're thinking of the, the, the Civil War cave. That's called Smallin Cave. Uh, but right there along the, uh, along the river, there are several caves right there close to Ozark. In fact, Missouri's a cave state. We have tons of caves. And we're finding more and more that uh, that are undiscovered all the time. Between that and sinkholes, uh, like uh, for example, like, like I've talked about it on the show before, Chris has been out there with me. The cave out at Smittle, the Smittle Cave, uh, it, that did not happen. The, the the kiss and we made up story that they have on the Department of, uh, Department of Conservation's website. The Smittles didn't donate that land; they lost it in a court battle. And even today, you can't get access to that cave. Mm -hmm. uh, David Bice says there's that flooded cave in Missouri there's a couple of flooded caves but there's one that you can actually just like take paddle boats through and swim in it uh, I can't remember what it's called uh, my wife had uh, brochures to it we were wanting to go up there to that one at one point but we haven't made it up there then there's that big cave um, right there uh, Stanton Missouri Chris do you know the name of that one no uh, no, I'm just sitting here trying to think of that cave that we went to that one time with the the mur murals on the wall, and then uh, oh, pig, that's pig we went back cave. in had that dead deer in there. That was pig demon cave. Okay, yeah. I was thinking, thinking that was some of, uh, private property that we got permission yeah, to go. Yeah, that was pig demon. You had we had to go up to the the, the farmhouse and they had that big mural on the wall. And the guy got real serious when I asked about it. Yeah. Yeah, we had, to, we had to go sign in and then come back and sign out when we left the cave. Yeah, there was a deer carcass back in that cave. Hey, dear, you're not talking about uh, in Stanton. You're not talking about Merrimack Caverns, are you? Uh, yeah, Merrimack. I couldn't remember the name of it. Yeah, uh, uh, that's the uh, the one that uh, Jesse James used to use as a hideout back in the day. Sure is. That's a really neat cave to tour if you get a chance. Uh, that's my case is DA, do you know the support, supposed location? of the family slaughter spot in the LBL. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, the, the ladies from Blondes and Booze have been there, and when I was in LBL, we looked for it. Uh, but we couldn't find the exact spot, but I've been told where it's at now. Uh, but if yeah. you go off of the trace down the section of road, and I think it's, don't quote me on this, I think it's like 114 or 115 is the name of the road. It's the road that goes to Demumbers Bay. It's off that road. Barton knows exactly where it's at. So, yeah, Barton does, and so do the girls from Blondes and Booze. They've been there. Uh, Roxanne Galgado says Truman Lake has a cave. It has blind fish in it. There's lots of caves along those those man-made lakes. In fact, uh, the uh, at Ha Ha Tonka State Park, it, it's on a bluff overlooking uh, Lake of the Ozarks. And if you go down directly beneath it to the island, there is a huge cave. In fact, in Apex Predator, Wolf Moon, the, the scene where they get get into a fight with the dogman in a cave, that cave's really there. Uh, they've got the concreted over the, the entrance with, with rebar, so you can't get back into it. But when I, when I was 15, 16 years old, it was nothing for us to go back in that cave. And there are other caves along mm -hmm. that cliff. Uh, there's that area they call Devil's Kitchen down there by Haha Tonka. And then across the road on the other side from Ha Tonka, there's a massive cave that they've they've never found the end of. They've only had expeditions go back in that for you know six to ten hours at a time. Uh, they've never done multi day expeditions, but they've not found the back of it. Hmm. Sorry, trying to uh, catch up with the comments. They're flying tonight. <laughs> yeah, they were. Uh, Robert yeah, D says there was so. also a bow hunter around the time of a couple that was, that was camping in LBL that was killed. Uh, there's a couple of bow hunters, and I was just talking to somebody, and I'm not going to say who it was, uh, but supposedly that area 
down by Demumbers Bay where I so brilliantly went off by myself about two o'clock in the morning and played played uh, dying rabbit calls. Uh, supposedly that is one of the most dangerous areas in LBL, and I did not know that at the time. Uh, supposedly on that road alone uh, is is somewhere near a dozen people that have been killed and went missing on that one road alone. Uh, Roxanne says, DA, Cave by Ozark City is the one the cave they found a giant skeleton in the 1880s. That was probably sm uh, small in Civil War cave. The... Back to the uh, the caves in the swamp thing. Um, there was a documentary I watched a couple of years ago where they were trying to uh, trying to check on alligator populations because they were mm -hmm. they were kind of they thought they were going down or weren't going up as far as they should or or whatever, and they actually found a cave that was like you said underwater. They had to go in underwater and when they went in they found like like i want to say 150 to 200 alligators in this cave just like i guess uh hibernating inside this cave so that's through that yeah but i mean that's, that's, a, that's, that's a, a nope moment yeah but that's <laughs> a i mean that's a possibility if you got a cave big enough to hold 150 200 alligators that's got to be a good, pretty good sized cave. Yeah, well, the the one that uh, that's down by Nebo, Missouri, you've got to get into the into the river, and I can't remember which river that is. Uh, I want to say it's the Gasconade, but I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. That's what I'm I thinking. Think, I think it's the Gasconade, but you've yes. got to get into the water, then duck down below this this entrance. And part of the year that you can actually see the cave entrance, but when we were in it. The water had been it had been raining. The water wasn't flowing fast, but it was up fairly high. So you had to duck in and then go underwater back about twenty yards, and then you opened up into a cave. That the the, the entrance to that cave once you ducked out of the water, and God dang, it had to be the you know the size of I don't know about half the size of a high school gymnasium. I mean, hey, inside there was freaking huge. And then that they had two tunnels that went off of it, one that went off to your left and one that went back. And the one that went off to the left didn't go very far. It went back and then got, you know, went into a crevasse that was, you know, too small for even, you know, even most small, small kids to get through. It was too big, too narrow for any of us to get through. But the one that went back, it just kept going. Eventually, you know, we're like, hey, we're going to be out of batteries and, and out of contact if we, if we keep going back. So I never did make it to the back of that cave. We used to go in yeah. all the time. I'm with David about that alligator cave there. I mean, I'm all about the critters, but hell no. Yeah, no thank you. <laughs> Some angry Play-Doh. That's funny. Angry Play-Doh. Yeah. Angry Play-Doh. Well, you know, really putty, the, the possibility of serious putty, and I believe there, if E4 fills that, fills that up roll nicely. Yep. And I had somebody uh, around the 4th of July, they were referring to sparklers as angry incense. <laughs> uh, I'm like, that works. But there's uh, what were you gonna say there, Robbie? I was just gonna say that. Uh, it's, I mean, there's a lot of times we just, we keep coming back to these caves because they keep tying themselves in in one way or the other. I just I think that's that's just something that has been so overlooked. I think. I just I think that's something that needs a lot more research to it. Northern California Cubs fan, thank you for the super chat. We are we were actually before we came on the show live, we were discussing what type of hat to get to Steve. So yeah, that it's in the works. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a uh, uh I uh I, I don't wear hats that often, uh except when I'm out you know, outside. You know, my hair is thinner than it used to be and <laughs> gotta watch the sunburns and whatnot, but yeah, I need to do something. 
uh, Robert D says, DA, take Steve down to LBL and have him pee on a tree down there. <laughs> Operation bring in the dog man. All right. Got it. Yeah, Steve's our bait. Uh, Mark Napier says, when I did cave rescue with my local fire department, we worked in huge caves, but that was in Kentucky, of course. <laughs> yeah, there, there are lots of lots of major caves here in Missouri. Um, you, uh, you, you'd be stunned how many, uh, and you know, some of them are, are absolutely massive. Uh, the caves that they take tours through down at Silver Dollar City, the when you go in through that open of the cave, opening of the cave, at one point they've got pictures of it. They inflated a hot air balloon inside that cave, and it was hovering off the ground, not touching the floor or the ceiling. The inside of that marble cave is massive. Noah says Steve would look pretty good with a flat cap, ivy cap, or a Panama hat. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've always liked the uh, like the uh, Irish, you know, drivers caps. You know, patty hats. Get, I, I'll yeah. have to get you one of these. I've yeah, got three or four of these. There you go. I, I wore a pin of my hat a couple of weeks ago, I think, if I remember correctly. An obnoxious band on it. There are some massive caves, and according to the the Department of uh, of uh, Conservation's website. Smittle Cave, which they have walled off and won't let anybody in, is supposedly the fifth largest cave in Missouri. And uh, I know before they got it completely walled off, a couple of us managed to get back in there. Not very far, but we did get back in there, and it was uh, it was pretty massive back then. Steve, if it would fit, I'd send you that one, but I know it won't fit your head. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, uh, it has to be sized for melon in order to... Uh... Yeah. Um, you know, as you're clicking through, you're small, medium, large, extra large. Damn. You know. <laughs> this was one of my, and this one has trouble even fitting on my noggin. Because I had this one when I was a little bit younger. So, what size That's is my, it? Uh, seven and eight. Yeah, it with you know part of it isn't the isn't the size; it's the fact that it needs to be kind of more square. <laughs> Wow, well, this one fits you, DA. It might. Little Patty, little Patty says, uh, says to get Steve a fedora. Uh, this one, this one's a, this one right here is a seven and a quarter, and it's a little loose on me. Yes, David, this was my bull rider hat, but that was when I was a lot younger. See, it does not quite fit me anymore. See, it's got the. I got really <laughs> stuck. Apparently, we're the same size as Noah. He says seven and three quarters. He and I apparently have the uh, the same sized. Uh, Satellites there. Uh, in all seriousness, when I'm outside, I usually wear a boonie. It's just that I don't tend to wear hats inside. I'll uh, show something on camera here in just a second. I got a seven and a half. Oh. oh, Cowboy's asking about my shirt. I picked this up around Father's Day. Toughest job you'll ever love, Dad. I, I thought it was kind of cool. Definitely. Let me get this adjusted, and I'll uh, I'll show it to everybody. Yeah, how many y'all are? Uh, how many y'all are familiar? Oh, I like that hat, Chris. Oh, thanks. How, how many cool. y'all are, are familiar with uh, with? Uh, the uh, Dark Frontiers book and Declan Kane. I'm talking. I'm sure you're excluding us, right? <laughs> oh, you guys. I know you guys have heard of it. But how, how many of y'all listening, listening have read? How many of you all uh, that are that are listening to us tonight have read Dark Frontiers with Declan Kane? Yeah, uh, since I, am the, I am here. Well, well, then then, then you'll recognize Declan's hat. There you go. Complete with U.S. Marshals badge. <laughs> this is the hat I wear when I write that when I write that series. <laughs> Got to conjure the uh, the spirit of the character, huh? That's right. And uh, I've got a Griswold for 
whenever I've got to coordinate scenes because I, you know, I, I always like to have have the feel of, of the of the right right uh, weapon in my hand. Same thing I do with the wild hunt books when when I'm writing a scene and somebody uses uh, one of the uh, the the uh, blades. I always get one out and hold on to it and kind of because I want to like. I want to feel how it sets up. I want to feel how it holds. You know how you would move it in certain in certain ways. Uh, Mark Napier says, "Don't forget your Boggy Creek hat." I would show that one, but the green screen cre uh, screens it out. So you'd only get like an outline of whatever uh, of the hat. You know, Dia, you're kind of like the the author version of a method actor. Uh, you know, with the with your hats and your guns and your whatever is you're writing. I remember when I came to your house the last time. I think you made spaghetti, if I remember correctly. And uh, you were showing off the KSG and you show me your writing room and you had this piece of paper and you had tick marks all over it, you know, like hash marks. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And he goes, that's an ammo count. I'm like, what the fuck? It's like, well, yeah, I got to make sure they, 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 you know, they, they don't have the endless supply of ammo. They got to reload at certain points. I was like, oh, that's just cool. When I, you know, when I write a firefight, I'll write down the names of everybody involved in the firefight. And I'll say, you know, Clark's fired three times, and I'll go on the piece of paper, and I'll, I'll keep track of every round. And when when a slide should lock back, a slide's going to lock back. You, you don't have the Beverly Hills Cop thing where they fire, a, you know, 45, 46 rounds out of a Beretta. Yeah, without reloading, without with without an extended magazine. Yeah, I always just love on that when they, they win commando and the guy's not reloading. Was it Commando oh where Arnold Schwarzenegger's machine gun belt kept getting longer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. they'd pan the camera back and the belt's like, you know, twice as long as it was before. <laughs> and it's nice to see when other people hang out with you, cars don't get towed. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Scott says, "What do you do when you wear when you're writing Valkyrie's line? Uh, generally, when I when I'm doing the, any of the wild hunt stuff, uh, I kind of I kind of do things to put myself in the mood for those characters. But I don't really have anything per se for Valkyrie Valkyrie herself. But I, I, I've got a, a, a couple of military boonie hats that uh, one of them's desert camo and the other one is is uh, woodland camo. And I usually wear one of those uh, when uh, when I." Uh, in right and wild hunt. Oh, William Bedard says, "Hey, oh uh, yeah, dude, I've I've got actually have got that uh got that right here. It's got to get mailed out. I don't know if you can read it. Yeah, chrome it out. It's not showing it. No, it chrome key out. There, there you go. go. There you go. I can turn my light off." Those are going out in a couple of days. I had to wait till I had a, had a, a bunch of stuff together. Uh, and he says, uh, vote that Steve gets a Scottish Jimmy hat. There we go. <laughs> yeah, they're all just wanting to cover up my, my classy haircut. Well, you Patty know. says, what about your cold shack hat? It's right over here on, on the shelf. You know, it isn't just for North Korean dictators, you know. <laughs> That's funny. Ken says, I'm picturing DA writing a scene and switching hats when different characters are talking. That's funny. <laughs> it's accurate. It reminds me of those, uh, those one-man show scenes where they change the camera angle. So the guy's over the one line and they do it back. He's you know, facing the other direction. My beauty hat. Are we talking about the uh, my uh, your, tin foil your, hat? Uh, your tin foil hat with the nipple on top? Oh, yeah, I can make that happen. Uh, there we go. That's class right there. Let me tell you. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we got it. The aluminum nipple hat. You're making aluminum fedora. <laughs> there, there we go. go. <laughs> well, you know. It's a, it's a spinner on the aluminum floor hat. Well, you know, my wife kind of gave me a cross-eyed look when I started stealing her aluminum foil to make this thing. She's like, you realize that you're going to use a lot of foil on that melon. You know, like, I'll make a small hat. It'll be okay. 
Hell, you're trying to keep your hair fresh. <laughs> to keep the thoughts out of my head. Oh. <laughs> Looks like Steve Looks Mundick and, and man for his hat. It's amazing. I have a picture of, like, you know, jumping the tin man on a street corner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. So, Chris, tell us a little bit more about the uh, the stuff that's been going on on your land now. There hasn't been much. Um, the oldest boy got out of uh, his little um, hospitalization, shall we say. And uh, he's been, you know, when he got out, when he got here, I could not walk fence to fence. And now I can ride the ATV all the way across the property. But um, we still have some trees that ought not to be coming down that do. We've got one that's uh, um, got pushed over in the woods, has a pretty good root ball still on it. I, I want to get up that way, you know, get some good footage of the, of the, the tree breaks. Because you had the one yeah. that was snapped off that was about the diameter of a freaking bowling ball inside the dog. Yeah, room. that was... That was in my front yard. That's really you go to the front door, open the door, and it's like fifteen feet from the from the porch. Steve Keeney looks like the fifth Beatle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. His, his adoring public has requested his presence in the meeting. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's fun when he gets to this point because uh, it's a fun game to kind of yell his name to see which end runs towards you. That's funny. So how many how many tree breaks have you had on your property, Chris? I know you guys had uh, that that footage that your security camera caught of something peering around your outbuilding. Yeah, I think three that I'm one hundred percent sure of that you know just aren't trees falling. <laughs> but we had one that was back on our property, and yeah, I don't know what you know. I don't know if it's a tree break, you know. You know, something pushed it over. Um, nature decided it was done with that tree or, or what. But Have you noticed any tree formations like, uh, like X patterns or trees that have yeah, been Yeah, I sent you a couple like pictures. Mm -hmm. But that was on uh, the property right next to ours. We were just on the road on the ATV. One thing you also want to look out for is... is uh, Areas of brush that look like it's been set up as a blind. Yeah. Now I want to get up there with, with my new camera and start getting some images. Yeah, Crystal it'll loved that. When, after, it'll have to be after we get back from um, from uh, Gatlinburg because this is our, our last show until the – what was the date we gave? Last show until the 26th. Uh, the show that would be on the 12th, the 15th, the 19th, and the 22nd, we won't have shows any of those days because I will be out of town. Uh, Annette and I are going to spend some time up in the cabin in the woods up near Gatlinburg. Not in Gatlinburg itself. It's in the mountains up above Gatlinburg. Uh, we're going to be up there for a while, and then we're going to be at the Bigfoot Conference in Gatlinburg on the 22nd, and then we'll be coming home on the 23rd, I believe. Uh, so you know, Robbie's going to be there and there's going to be a whole bunch of folks there. Uh, if you guys like the show finding Bigfoot with the guys from the BFRO, they're all speakers there. Um, I, I'm just going to hang out with, with people like Robbie and the girls from blondes and booze and, and Cam Buckner are supposed to be there. I'm, I'm not paying the ticket to go hear them speak. I just, I got no interest in it. Uh, but, um, I, I will be there. And although I don't have a booth, uh, we weren't able to get a booth. I will have some books and patches in the vehicle. So if anybody's uh, interested in, in you know, getting an autograph book or, or a patch or something, you have to hit me up. I, I will have them with me. They just won't be won't be at the. Uh, I won't have a booth. Uh, Mark Napier says, "Yeah, smaller twisted trees and branches." Um, one of the guys I uh, I don't know if he's in the in the chat tonight. His name's Eric. He's a buddy of mine. He uh, has noticed that out on his land, and I've talked to other people here in Missouri too, have noticed that some of the, the, the stick formations and X formations that they're finding 
are near plant near a lot of plants with medicinal purposes, uh, like areas where they've had uh, spruce trees with a lot of bark stripped off of them. Spruce is a, is a great uh, the Native American have been Native Americans have been using spruce bark for years. Yeah, we, uh, we've got a lot it. of trees that are missing bark. A lot of tree bark has uh, has medicinal properties. Uh, pine bark, spruce bark, uh, a, lot of, a lot of those can like uh, spruce is uh, uh, we, uh, finding Bigfoot is the BFRO guys. That's all four of the people from the BFRO are speakers at uh, at Gatlinburg. Uh, and so you know, I think there's still VIP tickets if you're interested in, in, in listening to them. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I've got another another agenda entirely. Um. Uh, Dave says, "Which one is the BFR? It's the, the, the that show Finding Bigfoot. Those are the the guys from from the BFRO." Uh, Penny says, "Slippery Elm." Uh, David By says, "Why uh, White Willow is a pain reliever." There are a lot of a lot of different trees that have uh, have natural you know, mushrooms. A lot of different different plants have natural medicinal properties, and mm -hmm. um, I've noticed a lot of the researchers in the Southwest Missouri area, basically everywhere from Roughly, Laclede County down to down to the boot heel, and people that I've got contact with have all once. So I noticed it. Well, well, I discovered it with with my buddy Eric here up near uh, the near near the Niangua here in uh, close to Springfield, about 15, 20 miles away. And, uh, he you know, when he was saying, "Hey, this is what I got going on." I'm like, "What are these plants in the background?" And we got to talk, and he's like, "You know, you're right. All of these plants back here have medicinal value because uh, he's he's part Cherokee." And he uh, he said, yeah, I have one of these up medicinal value. And I said, well, I think it's weird that they're marking this plot, this plot where these medicinal trees are. So I started asking other researchers in this area, and they started getting back to me. And they're like, yeah, some of these areas that have tree break, the tree uh, uh, have these tree formations are right at areas with medicinal plants. Uh, so we're thinking that might have something to do with at least some of the explanation uh, for tree structures. Uh, I don't I mean, granted, we're not going to, you know, going to make the audacious claim that explains all of it. But it, you know, it's certainly something worth thinking. And it's something something that uh, more than one person has noticed. Uh, so, you know, it, it, if, if that even gives us a clue as to what some of the meaning is, we're, we're a little bit closer to the, uh, the you know, solving the riddle. Um, Miss Naomi says, Matt Moneymaker, Bobo Fay, uh, Renee Holland and Cliff Barrickman. Yeah, they're the, they're the four speakers at the convention. Hmm. Uh, angry, angry drunken term says, so for the noobs like myself, where do one stand on MBF origin, biblical alien, interdimensional, big ape, or other? We uh, we here on, on this show, we're we're more evidence-based. Uh, I'm not saying that that I, that any of the stuff that they refer to is the woo. The, I don't want saying interdimensional or, or biblical. I'm not saying any of that's impossible. I'm just saying that, you know, most of us have spent, you know, a good part of our careers in law enforcement, and we're going to look for physical explanations first. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've made the joke before, but it's, it's pretty much a fact. I mean, if we went to a, went to a crime scene and uh, there was a guy dead, you know, obviously that he had been murdered, but the house was locked tight and there was no signs of forced entry, my first, my first is first. Uh, first theory is not going to be something came through a dimensional portal and killed. Uh, I would be right. peeing in a cup come next morning. Uh, so right. we we look for the physical explanations. We look for logical explanations on what causes some of these things long before we start jumping to in, anything that beyond the normal, anything paranormal or or uh, metaphysical. Uh, like for example, there's so many. And this this is uh, something I've, I've hit on, and I'm going to do it again. Uh, Robbie's Robbie's a tracker. He's a train tracker. Works for his police department, and so many people have said, "Well, I was following Bigfoot tracks, and they just disappeared in the middle of a field." Um, that doesn't mean that they went into another dimension. The, the most logical explanation is they moved back on their tracks. Our own special mm -hmm. forces guys are taught to do that. Bears do that. Rabbits will do that. Backtrack on their tracks, mm -hmm. circle away from you. It, it, it is far more logical to think that something is an upright, intelligent primate is, is able to backtrack on its tracks where it can grab a tree branch or jump onto a rock and then, then you know, use trees or something to get a good distance away before dropping back to the ground again mm -hmm. to throw you off their trail. 
and we think that's far more believable than you know he just popped through a dimension because these these things are opportunistic and i do believe especially in cases like lbl that there's there's a lot of evidence that i'm not in every case but there is a lot of evidence that say cryptids that that will take on people they will take humans out especially if somebody's out by themselves and it's an easy present it presents an easy meal so if these things even one percent of the time are attacking and, and killing people even if it was one percent of the time if they were able to go through a dimensional portal we wouldn't stand a chance they would be yeah. just taking people at random out of houses there is no way that these things are are are, are doing that if they're if they're a predator uh, there's no other animal in the animal kingdom that does that. Uh, you know, lions don't pop through portals to take out to take out gazelles. Um, wolves don't don't use a dimensional portal to take down a buffalo. Uh, they hunt smart. They hunt in packs. Uh, so we, we look for the most logical explanation. I'm not saying that any of that other stuff is impossible uh, because we know CERN w was able to open a portal to another dimension. So we know. Other dimensions exist and portals are theoretically possible, but that doesn't mean that explains everything we can't find. Well, and, and for CERN to do it, it took, you know, terawatts of power, you know, right. a ridiculous amount. You know, there's a reason things like, uh, you know, in the, in the theory behind like warp drive, whatever, that they use things like antimatter to create the, the energy source for it because it, it takes a hell of a lot of energy to do that. I think officially, as far as like a stance for the show, I think we've talked about this before that, you know, when our show started out, what, two years ago, whatever it was, you know, I was the skeptic. Uh, I'm still the skeptic. You know, my official position is I'll believe it when I see it, but I really want to see it. <laughs> you know, I want to believe, I want to, I want to have that knowledge. Um, but uh, I'm kind of with DA and Robbie on it. It's like, you know, I'm going to assume the more natural explanation until I know otherwise. Well, you know, when it comes to, to, to cryptids, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer. I mean, I, I believe they're out there, but we've got a hard enough time convincing people they're out there without throwing in, you know, Scotty beamed them up and they left in the, the alien mothership. You, when you start throwing that, when you start throwing that try those type of explanations in, 90% of people, their eyes are just going to glaze over and they're going to think you're crazy. Again, I'm not saying that stuff's impossible. I'm saying we've got to prove they exist before we prove they're popping dimensions and, and doing things that no other animal on the planet does, including humans. Corey Pole says wild garlic is very, very antibacterial. There's a lot of, of natural uh, plants that, that have, have natural antibiotic properties, uh, a lot of them painkiller properties. Uh, some of them will soothe stomachs. Um, mm -hmm. did the digitalis, uh, comes from the foxglove plant, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, Native American and indigenous people have known about for a long time, long before we ever we realized it could be used, uh, uh like, uh, old, uh, hedge witches and, 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 uh, you know, and, uh, folk remedies, uh, describe, uh, prescribed foxglove tea for people with a bad heart. And it mm -hmm. wasn't until medical science determined they created digitalis that they admitted, Hey, there's something to this, this fox glove tea, uh, valerian root tea, uh, is good for calming your nerves and valerian root is what gives us value. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Tamiflu comes from star anise. That's, uh, you know, where they are able to, to, uh, come up with those, uh, uh elderberry, same thing, you know, antiviral properties. Uh, Penny, Penny Van says bee palm plants are part of a great salve recipe for antibiotic. Uh, back in the 1800s, it's something I've used in, in the books. Uh, like uh, doctors and, and medics during the Civil War would mix honey and spruce resin to seal wounds shut. And it helped prevent infections and it helped wounds to, to stay closed and pr promoted rapid healing. Uh, there's lots of lots of herbal remedies that have long since forgot, been forgotten in this modern age of modern medicine. Well, all but forgotten for everybody for the First Nations people. <laughs> yeah, true. They still got it. Uh, angry, angry drunken, drunken German says, "I personally ditch narcotics drugs for things like wild lettuce, valerian root, and kratom. All have worked better than the addictive drugs I was I was suggested." Uh, that was one of the reasons I switched pain management clinics because all they wanted to do was throw narcotics at me. I kept telling them, I don't want narcotics. 
And I finally got up, got on with the pain management that they said, okay, well, because we're not going to throw our narcotics at it. And that's how I wound up with the spinal ablation. And I don't, I don't take pain meds today. I don't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, do I still have back pain? Yes. Is it manageable? Yes. Yep. And you're not walking with a cane like you were before. That's right. I don't, I haven't had to walk with a cane in six months. Oh, we lost Robbie. Uh, he's having to do a uh, audio system reset. Oh, okay. But we are uh, at the point in the show we encounter our uh, our nightly uh, DAX market of technical issues. I thought we started with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. You, you did buy us about an hour and a half with that, Chris. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it. Robbie. It was audio reset time. Uh, Penny Van says spider webs do both. They would buy. Um, you know, and another thing they did during the Civil War is they would boil hair from from uh, horses' manes and tails, uh, and they would use that as for suture for suture lines because silk was very hard to get. Uh, mm -hmm. Which would say pain management without narcotics sutures. is the best way to go. It's the only way to go, man. I I I'm a writer. I mean that that's what I want. That's what I do. And I, the last thing I want, wanted was you know, heavy narcotics that made me have conversations with my couch. Although it did create some nice dialogue for, uh, you know, some of our characters. <laughs> True. Um, yeah, Tombs, uh, uh, Roots reacting to the uh, horse hair for sutures. You know, we still use cat gut for sutures. Uh, when anytime we have a dissolvable suture, we have to do you know multiple layers of sutures. It's made by, you know, animal gut. Uh, that's a good comment. Uh, Walatha says, if we could obtain government confirmation of the existence of these beings, then the knowledge base would explode. The government just refuses to discuss the subject, let alone admit they exist. I've been saying for a while, I think we're in the midst of a bunch of soft disclosures. Uh, several state governments have passed protection protection for uh, uh, for Bigfoot, uh, Bigfoot and, and other type creatures. Uh, except for the state of Oklahoma, they went the other direction. State of Oklahoma offered a three million three million dollar bounty on one brought in alive. Um, there are there are states all over the Pacific Northwest that have regulations preventing the hunting or harassment of them. And in 2019, uh, well, before the U.S. Congress and House of Representatives, legislation was introduced to alter federal hunting regulations to include certain near human chimeras. And that is an exact quote: certain near human chimeras. What is that to re referring to? Yeah. You know what? What are what are what are they worried about us hunting that is that is near human? Well, can can the term chimera even be associated with Bigfoot? Well, a chimera right. is just something that exhibits traits from more than one species. So right. yeah. It's exhibiting, you know, uh, ape-like tendencies and human-like tendencies. That would qualify as a chimera or a dogman. You know, human-like tendencies and wolf-like tendencies is very definitely a chimera. Right, or any two sets of genetic material, actually. Um, you know, because uh, there's been, been issues uh, where you had, like, human uh, offspring that were, uh, like, in rare occasions, had DNA from more than just the two parents. You know, there'd be Napier. DNA from two males, for example. And, you know, that's considered right. a chimera. Martin Napier says, what if they hunt or harass me? Well, then I would say it'd be like that episode of, of South Park when they went, went hunting. You just got to yell really loudly. It's coming right at us. <laughs> and make sure you have something bigger than a twenty two pistol. <laughs> You're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Even if it did have hollow points, it's still not going to do much more than sting something like that. Um, you know, uh, J.D. Smooth says the Army Corps of Engineers 
had a handbook written in 1975 in Washington dealing with Bigfoot. Yeah, it was mentioned in the survival course at Fort Hood. No, not Fort Hood, Fort uh, Joint Base uh, Lewis McCord. It was just Fort Lewis back. Hmm. You know, Chris, a funny story. You know, I, I always thought about, you know, things like, you know, ARs and 308s and whatever is being, being kind of the big, the big, uh, you know, the big guns. And then I started reading DA's books and realized that, you know, I, I don't own anything big enough to take out these things. <laughs> you know, we're looking at a 458 minimum. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Kay Bauer says catching a live dog man or Bigfoot would be like catching the wrong end of a running chainsaw. You ain't wrong. Yeah. And even if you were going to try to trank one, they have to have very specific doses to put down rhinos or elephants or gorillas. If you don't know the dose, to put one of those down. One, if you too, use too much, you could kill it. And two, if you don't use enough, you're just going to piss it off. Or you might it might fall down like it's asleep and then wake up and rip your arms off as you're trying to, trying to subdue it. You, you know, mm -hmm. without knowing what dosage to take one down, uh, you don't, you'd almost need a vet. Say, okay, we estimate this thing weighs 800 to 900 pounds. It's this big. We're going to try this dose. Uh, but they would have to be very careful with the dosage to trank one. And trapping one, going to get problematic. Uh, we, without knowing the upper limit of their strength, uh, most traps would probably get ripped apart. I or see. their just intelligence. Watch, watch mountain and then, watch. then when you talk about tranking it, you have to take into account, you know, what kind of metabolism does it have? You right. know, an 800-pound right. gorilla may have a metabolism that's, you know, a quarter the speed of, of, of a Bigfoot. And, you know, it'll hit the Bigfoot, it'll affect him, and then he's done, you know? Yeah. Right. Well, or even their intelligence level. I mean, yeah. you know, you look at some of these these types of traps, you know, it may work on something with the IQ of a, you know, raccoon. But, you know, if we're talking about something that conceivably could have near human intelligence, it takes a lot more to trap a person. Guess that's why they never get it in the traps on mountain monsters, right? <laughs> there you go. Well, he's reading from the Wiley e. Coyote book of traps. That's true. Oh. We just gotta quit buying from Acme and be okay. Very much so, yeah. They're coming out with season nine of that thing I saw the other day. I'm like, how has this show got nine seasons? Because <laughs> it's entertaining. Good point. Yeah. Very good point, Chris. It's <laughs> that's that's, well, that's something that folks need to bear in mind. In any of these shows, whether they're they're or they're on cable, 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 if they're on cable or if they're on on uh, any of the streaming services, the sole purpose of that show is to get ratings so they can make money off the show. Uh, odds are really good that any show that's on cable is more about making money than it is about actual research. So you've got to take sure. anything on those shows with a grain of salt. Uh, some of them are che more cheesy about it than others. Mountain Monsters. Uh, <laughs> that show is almost just funny. I mean, just you know, it's like the Duck Dynasty of the Cryptid world. It's not. It's not really <laughs> meant to be serious. Um, yeah. But uh, what yeah, do you mean, Wild time, Bill's not si not serious? That's right. <laughs> then, you, well, you, then you look at some of these other shows, and they try to present themselves as legitimate research, but. Well, after 10 seasons, they found nothing. Yeah. Well, and another thing to consider, too, is just a lot of times it's just the interactions between the cast that is so interesting. You know, just as an example, I'm not dogging any program, but, you know, I'm a big fan of The Deadliest Catch. Okay. It's been on for, what, 14, 16 years now? And it's a bunch oh, of guys yeah. hunting crab. But the interaction between the different characters is funny as hell. And it's compelling to watch that, even though what they're actually doing is pretty mundane. And, uh, you know, I, although I haven't watched, you know, Finding Sasquatch, I've seen enough of the clips about it to know that the interaction between these guys is funny. It's, it's compelling. It's interesting. You know, people are going to watch it for them. Yep. It's, it, it's kind of like the pro wrestling thing. I mean, People right. call pro, people call pro wrestling uh, a soap opera for men. Well, you know it's scripted. Uh, yeah. Anything 
where you know the outcome before before it starts. It's not a sport. Uh, you know, the outcome was already determined before the, before the first bell even rang. So it's just entertainment value. And that's the same right. thing with just about everything else on TV. And it's never more true than it is with the cryptid community. Every show that's out there on any of the networks, including Netflix and, and, and uh, Amazon, they're there first and foremost to make money for those networks. Uh, so do they take some liberties? More than likely. Do they show stuff and, and hype it up as evidence when it was really next to nothing? Probably. Uh, and in a lot of those cases, that the, they're just grasping at straws or, or just making, making crap up. And I'm not saying that in every case. And I'm not making fun of any specific, specific show. Uh, but I would be far more likely to believe evidence presented by, uh, by uh, small town monsters than anything on any of the networks. Because those guys are they're doing it themselves. And they don't rely on the funding of a network to produce <laughs> stuff. Poncho's got it. Scripted, cryptid. Yeah. Scripted, cryptid. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's good. I like that, Poncho. I love it. Well, Werewolf says you know, a twenty-two pistol will take out your partner's knee. Good point. Well, you, you don't have yeah, to Yeah, but be the partner had a 12 predator. gauge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't have to be faster than the predator. You just have to be faster than your friend. Sorry, I was checking. I was checking a couple of things. Um, Robbie, um, back to what I was saying about about uh, about tracking. Uh, we we I think we've got some new faces in here, and they mentioned you know how where we came down on things. Explain explain backtrack for, for those who may not understand. All right, one of the first things you learn when you're tracking is the different um and i'm not going to go into all the terminology but there's you know there's pressure release there's primary point of impact there's uh the way the track gets distressed there, there's dispersion there's all kinds of terms and terminology when you're talking about tracking that when you when you're walking forward in a normal stride your primary point of impact is going to be your heel. And when you drop when you drop your heel down on the ground and you roll your foot forward and you pick it up, you're dragging all kinds of dirt, debris, sticks, whatever's on the ground, you're dragging them forward with you. Okay? So if you're backtracking, your primary point of impact is not going to be your heel because you're walking backwards. Your primary point of impact is going to be your toe as you're walking backwards in your track. So the way the dispersion and the way things look in a track are going to be different if something's backtracking than if they're just walking forward. That's not something that just everybody can go and look at and say, oh, yeah. That. So if you're somebody who's not, not been through this and not looked at this, and not seen these examples and see how – because a lot of this – the differences can be kind of almost, I don't want to use the term microscopic, but if you're just standing there, standing up looking at these tracks, they're, they're going to look the exact same unless, unless something was un you know, was not careful about it. And, you know, you got a double step in a track where you can see kind of a, almost like a, an offset instead of it being completely lined up, it being a little bit of an offset, then you could tell, but if something's being careful, and putting his foot back down in the track where it's supposed to be, unless you're down looking at that track, you're not going to notice stuff like that. So if you're just the average person walking through who's never been through this training, and you see a track way going out and it just stops, that's what it's going to look. It's going to look like they just disappeared. Mm -hmm. But once you get down and start looking at those tracks and examine them and saying, "Oh, look, okay, here, you know, you can see where the primary point of impact is in the heel this way, but there's also one up here in the toe." and it's drug the dirt back down in the front of the track, and you start looking at all this stuff, and you're like, okay, there's something that's backtracked here. Right. But, well, it's like the, uh, the a few shows ago, we were talking about uh, uh, you know some of the training that our Special Forces guys get, and I was talking about that time I was uh, you know playing paintball with my Army Ranger friend. You know, we're in the middle of an oak savannah, and he vanishes. You know, I next found him, you know, when he shot me in the back of the head, you know, with a paintball gun uh, after vanishing. 
Now, granted, he is a highly trained person. He's been probably trained by the best people the U.S. Army could provide. But they did not teach him how to open a portal into another dimension. You know, they taught him how to work within the natural world to, you know, give him an advantage. And as a lay person who never served a day of military service in my life, it seemed supernatural to me when he came out of nowhere and got me, you know, but I can explain it away. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a natural, natural presumption on, on, on a person's part, a person on the, on a, in a person's mind to ascribe something beyond the normal when you can't explain what happened. I mean, look at most, look at stage magic. They're not really magic. They're just very, very good at sleight of the hand. Even if we can't explain how they did it, it's an illusion. It's not. It's not true magic. They're not making. You know, David Copperfield didn't make the Statue of Liberty disappear, uh, but it sure looked like it on national TV. It's just. Uh, well, if you watch the movies now, 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 I, now you see me, or I think that's what I was called, where they were showing some of the background on how these illusions are pulled off, or the the TV show Penn and Teller uh, uh, get Penn and, Penn and Teller get fooled or something like that. Fool pen and teller, where they would invite musicians on to try to try mm -hmm. to try to pull a trick that they couldn't explain. The Once prestige. in a while, somebody would do it. Yeah, the prestige. That's um, not a good one. Well, and yeah, if you don't the, know how it's done, it's amazing. You know, I got right. to meet Teller. That's several. mind blowing. Oh yeah, I got to meet Teller. Oh, twenty five years ago, give or take, and uh, I was sitting across the table from him uh, at at a dinner. And, uh, of course, I am not a magician. I, I, I can't even do simple card tricks. Uh, but in the course of the dinner, you know, we were having a conversation. He made my watch disappear. You know, I got it back at the end of the evening. But, you know, it was magic as far as I was concerned. Okay. You know. Look at Chris Angel. Some of the stuff he does, until you see how he does it, that's some of the closest to actual magic that you could actually fathom as happening. I mean, I've said, I've watched him get run over by a steamroller and I'm like, how does that happen? <laughs> and then he finally started putting out stuff that showed how he, how he did this where they had that little, uh, I guess it was made out of foam rubber mm -hmm. to where it pushed him down inside the, but the still, void. Yeah, I mean, and you, know, you but you look at this stuff and you're like, you're sitting there and it, it it boggles your mind because you're like, how is it possible for him to lay there? <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, Ken, <laughs> I love Ken. Yep, <laughs> Doc's not here, so he's got he got he got Steve a little bit ago. I was laughing at that. Oh yeah. Hey, see, I, I'm low hanging fruit, though. <laughs> I'm pretty easy target. Yeah, data question, but back to the uh, the tracking thing. Data uh, question, put that up. Yes, Chuck Connors did explain that in the Rifleman. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, and that's you know that that's it, it is what it, if you don't know that kind of stuff, you don't know that terminology, you don't know how to do, how to look for that. It's not gonna it's gonna look just like one of a. Uh, David Blaine or Chris Angel or David Copperfield, it's going to look just like one of their tricks to somebody because they're not going to know. But well, there was a video that went around for quite a while when the army switched to its newest generation of camouflage, and they were there was a video going around of them modeling the new camo, and uh, they had a guy standing in front of a wooded background, and he was in plain sight. They said, "All right, take the six steps back," and he took six steps back, and he was still there. And he takes another six steps and he's like right at the wood line and he's still there. And then he takes six more steps and he's gone. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, it's like you said, Penn and Teller, that, that show that they've got, uh, Fool Me or whatever it's called, you know, they're sitting there watching these magicians try to do these tricks. And to them, it looks a whole lot different than what it does to all of us out here who are not trained magicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Ken says you're not low hanging to me or Doc. We'd have to stand on a bucket to look you in the eye. <laughs> well, you know, it's the reason I can get away with wearing a haircut like this, Ken, is you know, most people can't see the top of my head. And uh, you know, they 
<laughs> when, when you, as somebody taller than we got a problem. So, but it's all it's all about perspective. If you're, you know, the same thing with some of the law enforcement stuff that, that you and I have seen, DA. It, you know, if you and I go into a crime scene and look at a crime scene where somebody's been shot or whatever, to me and you, it's going to look a whole lot different than to somebody who's never seen a crime scene before in their life. Right. They're not going to know where to start looking to start looking for splatter versus spatter or, you know, you know, different things like that because they don't have that perspective. Same thing. If you're out just walking in the woods, you find some footprints and you don't know how to track. It's going to look a lot different. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm an expert or trying to brag on myself, but because I was there too, until I took that class, I, I, I probably wouldn't have known what to look for, but now that I know what to get down, I still have to get down and look for it and figure out if that's what happened. But you know, if you don't know what you're looking for or what you're looking at, it's going to look mesmerizing. Well, it's exactly. like that, uh, that statement, I'm probably paraphrasing it badly, but you know, any sufficient technology is going to look like magic you know, to, to a culture that's, that's not familiar with that technology, you yeah. know, and, and, uh, same principle. Oh, look a second. I am telling Noah something. Mark, uh, yeah, investigation discovery is not gone. <laughs> they they still glamorize a lot of that stuff. We don't. You know, I always got a kick out of watching CSI when they get a complete DNA profile in 20 minutes on something. And then in the real oh, world, God, they, yeah. the lab sends it off for eight months <laughs> to get a result. Yeah. Eight, eight months, if you're lucky, the Missouri Crime Lab has got a two-year backlog. Oh shit! You're you're lucky to get DNA results in time for the trial. Yeah. Shit. Well, I, I, well, I know, uh, are just keeping their fingers crossed that the DNA comes back. I've got cases I worked seven years ago that have not come back from sled yet. Well, they told us, and when I went into nursing, to make sure that we keep take really good notes and you know make sure our charts are really accurate and detailed, because if we were to get sued for a medical situation they would probably come to trial in five years and i'm like in five years i am not gonna remember shit about this you know. that's so dope that's why they always tell us you know write a solid report because by the time it goes to trial you're like well, i don't remember well you remember yeah. what happened on this incident hell i don't remember it happening so we've got to write a really well detailed report to go from. yeah you yeah, know i don't remember what i had for breakfast two days ago let alone you know, yeah, I've slept, what happened? I've slept since then. <laughs> uh, Ken Brock, uh, Brock Lane says, at one point, our stage lab wouldn't do DNA tests unless it reached a certain felony crime level. Yeah, state of Missouri was like that for a while. They were so backlogged with, you know, DNA requests for every crime that got, came across a detective's desk that they were prioritizing murder, you know, capital murder cases over everything else. We're like, look, this is a burglary case. It's going to have to wait. Well, even some of the, the, the local law enforcement, you know, several years ago, I got robbed. And, uh, you know, the, the person that did it was clearly an amateur, you know, was, you know, quote unquote evidence all over the place. They wouldn't even bother to take any fingerprints when they came out because they're like, it wasn't a priority. It was, you know, there was less than like 500 bucks stolen and whatever, but you know, they didn't have the bandwidth to, to even try to run the fingerprints. Yeah. You know? Uh, boy, we are coming up on the two hour mark. Um, how about we uh, we take a minute and, and talk about our affiliate program? Sounds good. Right. 
Steve, you're in the medical field and Pocket Doc couldn't be here. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about uh, Dark Angel Medical? Sure. So uh, Dark Angel Medical, uh, of course, is a, uh, a um, medical kit, trauma kit uh, company. Our, our friend, uh, uh, you know, Carrie Pocket Doc Davis, uh, found this uh, about 11 years ago, give or take. And uh, they make uh, these these kits. And uh, they are uh, all American made. Uh, it's all American made products and uh, is the real deal. And in addition to selling the kits, uh, Doc and his staff will grow and they will train you how to use the kit. Uh, and uh, probably the, the most significant thing about them, other than they're all American made, is their kit for life guarantee. And basically, uh, if you use one of their kits to save a life, you email them, you tell them the story and send them back the guts of the kit. They will look over what's there, replace what's missing, reseal it, send it back out to you. So you have a kit for life. And uh, I think at last count, they were up over a couple hundred saves. Uh, uh, I think 170. I think that 170? 170. I was close. I was close. So thank you for the clarification. Uh, but their stuff is is great. Uh, they feature very prominently into in the uh, the DA verse books, uh, and uh, you know several of his kids have saved quite of our quite a few of our favorite characters in the stories, and um, it's uh, it, it's the best out there. And uh, you know they've got kits all the way ranging from you know their ouch pouch, which is your basic first aid kit, uh, all the way up to you know, your mass casualty, you know, shit went down in a military engagement kind of kit. There you go. And uh, so uh, if you use the code CRYPTID25, you get 25% off of your order. Uh, and uh, what is it about the, uh, is it Team Odin you put in the order description? You can get one of the rockers. Either Team the, Odin uh, or code name Wild Hunt, either one. Yeah. And you'll get a Team yeah. Odin rocker for your pouch. Yeah, get one of the uh, rockers like this top of this here should not show up on camera very well um but uh, i'm excited i'm actually getting my kit on tuesday that i ordered a while back and yes i did use the 25 percent discount because doc's awesome that way and uh i'm looking forward to having it and you know uh it's like anything else you know it's uh uh what was the uh the statement it's better to have and don't need than need and don't have and if you uh, need it and don't have it you'll never need it again you know pretty much like I like a parachute, parachute. Yep. Uh, so <laughs> it's good stuff. Good stuff. And uh, like I said, it's all American made. Um, they are not cheap kits because they are not cheap kits. Uh, they're made with good stuff and you're, you're going to get, you know, something that's going to do the job and it's going to do the job right. And if you exactly. don't know how to use it, you could get the education to do it. Some of, some of the basic education, uh, basic first aid classes are available on uh, Dark Angel Medical's a YouTube channel, which is at YouTube at Dark Angel Medical. Uh, but you can take some of those classes for free, but some of the other more advanced uh, trauma classes and stuff uh, are sign up, and you can take some of those in person. I know a couple of people in our chat have taken those classes. They're absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, the, the life you save could very well be your own or somebody, somebody close to you. Uh, because if you're going to go out camping, fishing, hunting, backpacking, go into the range, or if you're crazy like some of us and want to go out and see if you can poke the bear and actually run into a cryptid, you might just need more than just basic, you know, basic first aid. You might need more than what, what was that? A thiolate and a band aid. Right. You know, there you go. You know, some things you ain't going to glue together with super glue. Um, you know, and, uh, and your doc is, uh, uh, what was it? A flight medic? Is that what he was in the Air Force? Yeah, he was a flight medic, special forces so, flight medic. You know, so he's done the real deal, and uh, you know, uh, in the Wild Hunt books, you know, they uh, it, it, it has a lot of input in some of those. The reason that you know, fictional version of Doc is in there is because you know, some of these late night uh, writing sessions, you know, DAs reach out to him. You know, I just put this dude through this X Y Z. Is he going to survive it? Nope. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay, let me change it. Now. <laughs> yeah. I I picked Steve and, and, and Doc's brains a lot when it comes when it comes to, to keeping characters alive. Generally for battlefield trauma, Doc's my go to guy. If I write oh, a yeah. theme and somebody takes a hit, I'm like, all right, how bad off did I just make this guy? And sometimes he's like, Oh that he'll just rug that off and nothing flat and like be like, Oh crap, I gotta make it a little worse. 
And then sometimes he's like, oh, you just killed this dude. He ain't coming out of that. Like, ah, damn it. I got to rewrite this entire scene. Right. But uh, he, he knows the stuff, you know. Uh, DA keeps on alluding to you know, me and Doc being his medical experts. You know, the, the medicine that I have done has been in a controlled environment in a level one trauma center. Um, I am not the guy you want with you when when you uh, you decided to go try to collect that reward on the Oklahoma Bigfoot and things went pear shaped. Sorry, I'll, uh, but you know you would if it came to in the field and something bad happened. You, they, we would much rather have you than me because if I if I can't if I can't put a tourniquet on it or splint it, you're done. I, I'm sorry, I'm just not that good at not, not that good at first aid. I can I can tourniquet something and I can do basic first aid. But, uh, you know, you would much rather have Steve or Doc if, you well, know, the shit hit the fan. Yeah, I could have helped out a wound. long time ago. Yeah, I could suture a wound. I've sewed myself up uh, and whatnot. Would... But, uh, but yeah, uh, it, I still want Doc and some of that stuff. Penny yeah. Van said, Steve, did you mention the kit for life kit, I guarantee? I did. I did. They are kit for life. So, meaning... Uh, just to kind of repeat, if, if you use the kit and you save a life, uh, or at least the attempt to save a life, uh, and you, you, uh, write in, uh, to Dark Angel uh, Medical about, you know, the circumstances of that, uh, they will essentially in inspect your kit, replace the missing stuff, and you're back to a brand new kit. And, uh, as DA said earlier, they're up to, uh, 170 saves 170 at this point. last I knew. Um, you know, so that's 170 people that had a tomorrow because of these kits. And that is absolutely amazing. And uh, that is worth every penny. And, uh, you know, it's nice to know that when the time comes, if the time comes, you open that kit up, it's going to do what it's meant to do. And, uh, you know, you're, you're going to, uh, you know, that's not the moment we want to open the thing up and go, oh, well, that, that, that discount kit I bought from China didn't really do what I hoped it would do. As Doc is fond to say, he's packing birthdays in boxes. There yeah. you go. And he said, like Martin Maker said, don't send the bloody nasty you stuff back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please don't. <laughs> yeah, what happened? Folks, check over it. Check out a Dark Angel Medical or use the uh, the link that's posted in the chat. And don't forget to use the discount code CRYPTID25 for 25% off your order. Robbie, you yeah. want to tell us a little bit about the Scallywag Tax? Sure thing. Speaking of our veteran-owned companies, Scallywag Tactical, very uh, prominently featured in all of DA's books, makes some of the best folding and fixed blade and kitchen knives that then you can get your hands on. Uh, it's a... That would be the privateer. Can't see. It's, mm -hmm. Yep, privateer. This is the Jolly Roger. This is the razor. The razor DA's got razor razor folder. They have a razor folder and a razor fixed. And this is the uh, sailor assisted folder. Uh, Steve's got some. He, what you got? The mini jack and I've got the privateer, the Jolly Roger, the Orca, and then I carry the mini yep. jack every day. Yep. Yeah. I've got the my Orca is what I carry in my uniform. This is my shop knife. And this is when I get dressed up and go out on a town knife, you know, if I'm just out. Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's the pretty one. There but you uh, you're not going to go find hey, – that's that's the bad boy right there, though. The gunner's mate. The gunner's mate. Yep. That's like the, uh, the holy grail of Scallywag Tactical Knives. No, the Holy Grail is the bounty. Good luck catching them in stock. Oh, you can't catch yeah. the winners made of stock either. Here's one. Here's one of their blades that's completely out of stock. It's called the Valhalla, uh, and you cannot find them. You, you know, if you're a member of the Scallywag Facebook group, once in a while these will change hands among the among the the uh, members of the group. Uh, but they they are no longer in production. It's called the Valhalla. It's a Sayax blade. Uh, just absolutely stupid sharp, and uh, I was lucky enough to get my hands on them. Really, yep. really yep. All of their it. blades are absolutely stupid sharp. Yep. There was, well, was one about to, about to say, Steve, they, they, I've had this knife probably going on six months, 
and it's as sharp now as it was the day I got it out of the box. And it'll cut you three ways, long, deep, and continuous. So you better have yep. your scally or you better have your uh dark angel medical kit with you when you start messing around with these knives because you know, I'm not scared of my gun because I know which I know how how that gun's gonna hurt me. A good knife, you better be scared of. Because if it's a good well, knife, there was a, there was a night that DA was showing off his new scallywag knife and how sharp it was, and he managed to, uh, in attempting to slice the hair off his arm, sliced himself down to the endodermis, and we really thought we were going to have to get some quick clot on him before it was done. Well, Steve, it uh, was like crazy. I, I did the same stupid thing, but it was on Wednesday night show, so you wasn't there and didn't get to see my stupidity. But I, I want to say it was my Jolly Roger, what a DA. I was talking about it and it popped out of my hand and like a dummy I went and reached to try to grab it and caught the blade and bled for like what 15 20 minutes DA. <laughs> yeah. It's, so. it's crazy how sharp they are. And the stuff is made out of the best metals out there. Um you know, compared to you and DA, I'm kind of a knife idiot. I only recently started, you know, collecting them. And uh That's I didn't much know for that stuff. Well, I didn't know the difference between some of these things. And, uh, you know, I, I bought the, uh, my first blade was the privateer and it was made out of D2 die steel. And, uh, I didn't realize that it's like some of the hardest steel on the planet. And so it stays wicked sharp forever virtually. Uh, but it makes it brittle as hell. And if you try prying things open, like an idiot, you're going to break the blade. And, and, uh, Craig was kind enough to educate me and repair my blade when I screwed it up. And, uh, you know, you, you learn how great these things are and how sharp they stay and you appreciate having them and respecting them. Well, you can also go to uh, Scallywag Tactical and look up their blemished blades. They have a lot of their blades on the blemish, uh, blemish blade sale and you can pick up some of the, some of the blades like the, well, most of the blades I've got are from the blemished blades, uh, blades but you can pick too. up, you can pick up like the Orca or the one like uh, Robbie just showed you the, the Jolly Roger. You can pick those up. Uh, for a fraction of what they're normally priced on the website, and the ten percent discount still works. Yep. Uh, I, I think you can get an orca for like eight bucks. Yep. This is yep. normally a forty-five dollar knife. I got this one for fifteen dollars. This is normally a forty-five dollar knife. I think I got it. Got this one for ten, or it may be this was ten and this was fit. One of them was ten, and one of them was fifteen. The orca is now like eight. I paid more in shipping than I paid for the knives, mm -hmm. and I dare you. It, even at $45, if you pay, paid full price for this, I dare you to go find me a Benchmade or a Kershaw, Spider Coat, any of those knives that you're going to pay $150, $200, some of them even $300 for. Uh, was it CRKT, I think, DA, is the one that's really mm -hmm. popular right now? You know, you can pay up three, four $400 sometimes for a folder. I dare you to go find me one of those that's going to be any better than one of these. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to stay. Yeah. I've got I've got two Kershaws over there on my nightstand that these knives have just pretty much retired my Kershaws. And Kershaw makes a good knife. They retired yeah. my Gerber. Yeah, I carry that Gerber, Gerber for nice. ever, and I, I I don't even carry that Gerber anymore because I, yeah. I, I, every time I use that Gerber, I was sharpening it. These scallywags, like uh, my Jolly Roger, that's part of my, one of my everyday carry. I, I I've had that thing for eighteen months. I don't think I've run it on a stone once. Yeah. Well, I, I carry just a mini jack, you know, tiny little knife. And, uh, you know, I cut zip ties every day with it. And uh, I haven't sharpened it since I got it. And I've had it for six, eight months now. Yep. But, uh, you know, definitely check them out, folks. It's Scallywag Tackle. And don't forget to check that Blemish Blade sale. Uh, they yep. have some fantastic deals on the Blemish Blades. Uh, and yep. use discount code DA Roberts 10 for 10% off your entire order. That includes the Blemish Blades. Mm hmm. Yep. You you want to tell us uh, so about uh, Brock's blades here, DA? Will do. And you know, with something brand new that uh, I just got from Ken today, uh, we now have a discount code for BrockBlades.com. Folks, if you uh, aren't familiar with Ken Brock, he's he's uh, we, we call him the tactical midget. He's uh, he's in he, he's in the chat pretty much all the time. Uh, he's he's a you know, career co career law enforcement hell of a good guy. And he makes these blades by hand in the shop behind his house. This one's called the Skane Dew, uh, which means black black dagger or black blade. 
It was the knife that the Highlanders would keep in their sock and sealed beneath their kilt. Uh, it's just wicked sharp. It's got a this one's got a titanium blade. But Ken's blades are all made custom to order their every. Even though he may have you know a particular style, like if you ordered say the Ardennes, which is the blade that Will Gray Eagle carries in the books. If you order an Ardennes, no two are identical. Uh, these are all handmade. Uh, and if you go to his website and you order any of the blades that are currently in stock on the website, which he just added some new ones, if you go to brockblades.com, when you place your order, you use the discount code CRYPTID10 for 10% off your order. And if you're ordering uh, ordering a custom blade, just go it's still just like before, mention that you heard about Brock Blades from this show and he'll still do the 10%. Uh, but you know the, the, the discount code CRYPTID10 applies any of the blades that are currently available for sale and he's got some fantastic blades over there folks and if you've got somebody in your life that's an outdoorsman or into, into following cryptids or a hunt or they're fishermen uh anybody that, that does anything outdoorsy or if they're a first responder law enforcement correction um military these, they, these are fields where people appreciate a damn good knife and uh, th there's no gift better than a custom-made knife uh, the, you, know, you can you can pick out the type of handle you want, the color you want, uh, the specifications of the blade, and he'll custom make those to your to your 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 order. Just absolutely fantastic blades. And uh, one thing I want to point out about all of these is these guys weren't just pulled out of a hat. Uh, every one of these guys, Scallywag Tactical, Brock Blades, and uh, Dark Angel Medical, they're they're chosen for a reason. They're all veteran or first responder owned companies and we are big into supporting our veteran owned and first responder owned businesses uh, companies like benchmade or trade or old timer if you buy a knife or if you go to any of these other companies and buy a medical kit these are large companies that probably won't even notice the sale yeah they'll ship it to you yeah you'll get you'll get your product but it's just a sale to them. But these small businesses that are veteran owned and first responder owned, every sale matters. Uh, these are small businesses that are that are still working to, to get their name out there and to grow and to support their families. Uh, so, you know, every sale matters to these folks. And uh, you, every order is is a, is important. And uh, I know I, I, being a being a writer, uh, you're, you're the support of everybody out there has been amazing uh i'm a i'm a retired cop i'm you know i'm, I'm this is this is this is what i do for a living now and it's it you know every every book you guys buy and every book you guys read or tell somebody about is huge uh can, and I'm, I'm so grateful that each and every one of you guys do it um and it, it, it does it makes a huge difference um so you know we're all about supporting our veterans and our first responders here and uh we we can't we can't say enough um uh, that's because uh, everybody that's uh, familiar with the show knows that the 22 a day foundation is something that's very near and dear to our hearts here. Uh, having put a number of, I've been to far too many funerals with folded flags. We'll just put it that way. Uh, we lose 22 veterans a day to, to suicide and that is 22 too many. Uh, the, uh, the 22 a day foundation and the fall hollow project are two, two, uh, two charities that we all feel very strongly about because these we know go directly to help the veterans. Um, there, are, there are some of the other bigger charities uh, and I'm not gonna knock anybody or point anybody out, but some of the big names, less than, a, less than a dollar of every hundred actually goes to the charity. Most of it goes to salaries. That's not the case with, with uh, the Till Val, Til Valhalla Project or the 22 a Day Foundation. 90% of what gets donated to those two causes goes to help veterans charities. And we are all on board for that. And if you're if you're wanting to support a law enforcement charity, Officer Down Memorial page is the best. The ODMP chronicles every law enforcement officer in the United States every year that we lose in the line of duty, whether whether it's and even and I I don't even like having to mention this part, but they even they even mention the ones that that we lost uh, to self inflicted. Uh, and again, I, I've I've seen too many too many brothers in uniform under a folded flag, and uh, it's something that's very near, very near and dear to my heart. I've I've been to way too many funerals uh, for for brothers and sisters in uniform. Um, 
So oh. those those charities are very near and dear to us. Well, the thing that people need to remember is everybody has to chase things into the shadows. When you spend your entire career fighting the darkness, you get a lot more shadows to hide things in. And it's it's hard to cope with that. And uh, I can only imagine what the what the veterans and the law enforcement and some of those other folks who've who've seen action have seen. Well, you know, even in the medical field, Steve, you guys see some pretty horrible stuff. I mean, oh. I, I, I work in the security at the hospital. We had to be there whenever and every helicopter came in. And seeing some of the trauma brought in on those helicopters, it's got to be hell on you guys that have to put those people back together. I mean, the, oh. one of the first times I met a helicopter, I was handed a pair of legs and said, keep up. Well, there's a reason what that, you guys, uh, that what you guys nurses deal with and paramedics you know, yeah. tend to have alcohol problems, drug problems, you know mental health struggles. Yeah, it's it's difficult sometimes. And I haven't seen near the stuff that they have. You know, I, I, I'm working in a poor man's ER. I, I am not frontline. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's legit. Um, I was going to say something, and it has completely slipped my mind. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, folks, just remember that because, uh, you know, my 30th anniversary is this, this week. Uh, we will be taking off the next two weeks. The next show we have will be on the 26th of this month. Uh, I'll be in Gatlinburg, Tennessee for a couple of weeks. I do plan on getting a bunch of writing done because we're basically going to go to a cabin for a week and we're going to buy provisions and we're probably going to leave the cabin very little. Uh, so I'm just going to have some peace and quiet, try to get some writing done and uh, spend some time with the wife. I mean, 30 years she's put up with my shenanigans. You know, so you know, she's she's up for sainthood in my book. Um, that's only there have, thirty years in marriage. That's not th the dating time Peter put up. Yeah, with that's you. true. And uh, well, in in my law enforcement career, um, there's three no four times that she's got the phone call. Doug's down. He's at the hospital. We need to get you out there. Uh, I've been hurt in the line of duty. One pretty severely. Uh, the others were were fairly minor. Um, but, uh, you know, they were, they, they warranted an ER trip. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, one in particular where you know, I was, I was in a neck brace for three months and couldn't remember my kids' names. So I had a severe concussion. Uh, but yeah, she's, she's, she's not lost a lot of sleep over the years. Uh, when I would, when I would put on my body armor and suit up and go to work. Uh, so you know, she, she's put up with you for 30 years. If she'd have just killed you, she had parole by now. Yeah, no kidding. She could have killed me, been out of jail by now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark Napier's and... right. Firemen, I count firemen, and even the guys that uh, we jokingly say drive the band aid bus, uh, the EMTs and 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 medics aboard the aboard the ambulances, firefighters. Those guys see some pretty horrible stuff. And we may give mm -hmm. firefighters crap and call them second responders and stuff like that because they will generally wait for the cops to clear the scene before they come in. But those guys see some pretty, pretty horrible crap. And it takes a special kind of stupid or a special kind of crazy to be running into a burning building when everybody else is running for their lives. So, yeah, our, our, our hats are off to all first responders from from ambulance crews on up. Everybody in the chain, there's you know medical personnel, the, the emergency room crews, firefighters, you know, correction staff, even security. There's a lot of security officers that are seeing a lot of crap, especially in some of these more dangerous environments. And we'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah throw in uh, Civil Air Patrol in there because that's who the Air Force calls to find lost airplanes. That's true. That's Civil true. Air Patrol. And we've had they, cadets. They got somebody we, we had cadets that found a downed aircraft with the pilot deceased in it. Well, and, and that's, security that's a lot for forces. kids to find. Yeah. You know, security forces, we appreciate that. You know, DA, when you and I first met, you know, uh, on the rare occasion, things started to get a little bit butt puckery uh, in my line of work. It was nice to know that you and your peers were showing up to back us up. You know, it's, I... Uh, it's always my pleasure I, to do it. Man. I've had a couple people that uh, decided to play the fool and you know, just getting ignorant. And I'm like, well, you don't have to respect me. You can respect the guy in the body armor that's got the gun because he's got my back. And uh, that usually will shut him up. 
Sorry, I, I'm kind of trailed off there for a minute. Um, <laughs> folks, you know, we want to thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts for being with us. Uh, we, we've had a blast doing these shows the last couple of years. We're now you know, almost 5,400 followers on YouTube, which is every time I check, is uh, it's up by a few. Uh, thank you guys so much for making all of this possible. And a, a huge shout out to everybody that's been so supportive of the books over the years. If you haven't checked out the books, I hope you will over at daroberts.net. All of the books that I currently have in print are available over there. Um, I am almost done, uh, well over 60,000 words now, uh, with the next installment of the Dark Frontiers novel. This one's going to be called Owl of the Wolfman. Uh, and hopefully I'll have it done in the next week or so. In fact, I'm going to be meeting with somebody tomorrow uh, uh, concerning the cover and everything. Uh, yeah, David Bay, we're doing an Ozarks good night. Yeah, you know, the you know, Ozarks. <laughs> There's varying stages of good night or goodbye. There's goodbye from the living room. There's goodbye from the door. There's the goodbye from the front porch. Then there's goodbye standing next to the vehicle, and then maybe even in the driveway. But I, I it takes forever to say goodbye in the Ozarks. Uh, so we're we're heading that direction. But you know, folks, again, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Chris, thanks for hanging out with us and and, and telling yep. and telling stories and talking crazy stuff. And uh, folks, we appreciate each and every one of you guys. And choosing to spend your evening with us. We hope you guys have a wonderful remainder of your week and uh, hope you have a fantastic weekend and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Uh, but look for, uh, look for some videos showing up on the channel uh, that'll probably be popping up from Gatlinburg. I'm going to be doing a lot of recording and hopefully that uh, while we're at the Bigfoot conference, I can sit down and get some recorded time with Cam Buckner and a few other, a few other folks that are going to be there. And if you're going to be in the, in the Gatlinburg area on Saturday, the 22nd of this month, uh, again, the Gatlinburg Bigfoot Conference is going to be in full swing. Uh, we'll be there. And I, I don't, again, I don't have a booth, but I'll have books and some other stuff on hand. So hopefully if you guys uh, want to come by and say howdy, we'd love to meet hey, you. When you're out in Gatlinburg, um, go out to Cades Cove. Yep. Yeah, I'll definitely check that out then. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'll call you when, when we're done with this. Okay. Um, Actually, Chris, just don't don't disconnect. We always talk after the show, so okay. Just don't just wait wait till we we go off the air and we can talk. Uh, but folks, okay. thank you guys so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we'll see you guys on the twenty sixth of this month. Uh, big shout out and thank you to all the moderators. You guys do an awesome job. We appreciate all the mods. Hashtag DAX mods rock. Uh, thank you guys for being part of the DAX Maka Nation. Uh, and uh, if you guys uh, would like to help shape the future of the DA verse and read a lot of short stories that are not currently available anywhere else, you can do so by joining the Patreon community at patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. And uh, we'd love to love to have your input on covers and, and book ideas and everything in between. So hopefully you guys will check that out over patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. So folks, thank you guys for hanging out with us and we'll see you guys in two weeks. Uh, and uh, we'll have a whole bunch of new stories and, hopefully some new videos and a lot to share with these folks. So you guys have, have a great time. And, and again, big shout out, happy 30th anniversary to my wife out there. Uh, if she's listening, which again, she's probably not, she's probably watching true crime dramas. Uh, but you know, thanks for 30 amazing years, babe. And uh, we will see you guys in two weeks. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again, Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.